Again, good morning, um, everyone. And I'm sure you've really had a great um, time the last, this last few days. Um, it's really, really a pleasure um, to be here in the midst of like-minded people that are working towards a common goal. I would really like to thank Jed Moody and his team for hosting, for continuing to host this event for the last three years. It's truly a labor of love. When I say that, we have, I have firsthand experience. We hosted the mid-year um, mid meeting, and we, what we offered during the mid-year meeting was just a portion of what Jed has offered to all of you here today. And what he is doing primarily is to ensure that the UNC system continues to take the lead in transforming our energy use and future here in the state of North Carolina. Even given the fact that at this time of restrictive budgets and all kinds of necessary fiscal responsibility that we have to take into account. My name is Mary Annie Basiaco and I'm the Director of Energy Services and Sustainability at the North Carolina a and um, We hosted the major summit in February, like I said, and we had over 83% of people in attendance of those that were registered from faculty, staff, students, and some industry partners, and also some of the community members. Of all the people that attended that summit, one group stood out the most. One group that, and I can see all the faces here today, and that is our, our students. Okay, they showed us the reason why we as a UNC systems, faculty, staff, administrators, why we must continue to collaborate. We're here today because of you. Um, we're here today because you came in and you showed us that we need to manage our resources more effectively in order to ensure that you get a quality education and also to ensure that our great state of North Carolina continues to provide future leadership that's needed in this turbulent times. I'll just talk a little bit about North Carolina a and um, We are a historically black institution in Greensboro, but in spite of that, um, we have invested heavily um, in energy and sustainability and we are on track to meet our set goals both with the state and also at the federal levels. But one of the things that we found that was very, very critical that we needed to do to, in order to sustain some of our gains was really how do we engage the students? How do we engage the faculty? How do we engage the staff around this concept of energy um, conservation and sustainability? That is really the key in all this that we're doing today. We're meeting here annually or during the mid-year to continue that fellowship, that exchange of ideas, and how do we um, maintain our gains and how do we sustain those gains moving forward. In order to sustain those gains, one of the things we are looking at or we're grappling with at the North Carolina a and State University is fully understanding that sustainability is here to stay. It's a paradigm shift. Yes, we're here as an energy summit, but energy is a subset of sustainability. Sustainability makes good business sense. You are the future leaders um, that we are taxed to educate. So our challenge is really, how do we, at least for the next 10 years, how do we continue to build, how do we continue to add to the economic engine of our future? And how do we continue to educate you, our future leaders, to make sure that you can sustain the gains, not just within the schools, within the state of North Carolina, and ultimately within the nation and the world. One thing that we know for sure, sustainability cuts across all areas. Okay, it has crossed a new threshold as the business opportunity of the 21st century. Either we get on board or we lose our competitive edge. It has become the cross-connection innovation engine across all the universities. I looked at the heading of the theme for this summit. It was titled Disruption and Innovation. And really sustainability is all about innovation. Um, there's gonna be, there's no single pure play when it comes to sustainability. All areas of the university is impacted. 
Granted, sometimes it, it starts from the facilities group or the operations group, but it cuts across all areas, the academics, the industries, the administrative areas, the community. So we know that as a UNC system, that if we implement some of these sustainability principles, we are definitely going to see an improvement in, an improvement in our revenues for the university system. And we know for sure that this will, I mean, we're gonna see an improvement in the revenues for the UNC system we generate. And another thing too, I am coming from the facility standpoint. One of the things that we are looking at in facilities is how do we move? We are the biggest cost center for the university systems. How do we move or transition ourselves from being a cost center to a cost savings center and ultimately a profit center for the university? So sustainability cuts across all those areas. What does it mean for us as a UNC system? It's gonna mean a paradigm shift. And that's the importance of our gathering annually to change our mindset, to change the way we do business. Okay, because the green economy is the mother of all markets, something that will fuel innovation. This is an opportunity for us to grow as an institution as a state, and virtually everything that an institution or a business can do to go green today will make it stronger, healthier, more innovative, more competitive, and more inspiring to the customers, which is you. We are at App State today. Most people come to App State, why? Because it's a green institution, because it's a sustainable institution. And that's what all the other UNC systems are striving to do because that attracts people, that attracts industry. So we have to take advantage of this innovative engine that has been presented to us today. So in essence, this sustainability revolution has ushered in, as historians call it, it's a basic innovation, a decisive time that creates new industries, transforms existing ones, and over time, shape societies and the question for all of us today both at the student level and at the leadership level is whether or not we can take advantage of these opportunities while also improving clean air clean water and using less energy so this kind of segues into um, the introduction of our keynote speaker for this morning um, he is from the North Bridge the Northridge Energy Partners. And basically, we are aware that there's so much disruption in the market that we're facing today because of this sustainability um, engine that's moving a lot of things. We know that the electricity grid is evolving. The power markets are shifting. They're volatile. They're fragmented and constantly changing due to regulatory, legislative, and energy policy activities and the rapid mainstream of, mainstreaming of new technology. Basically, Northbridge Energy Partners, they help clients such as us or other entities to recognize, prepare for, and benefit from the opportunities as they position themselves and their technologies according to market dynamics and customer needs and competition. Our keynote speaker today, Mr. Peter Kelly Detweiler, is the, the co-founder of Northbridge Energy Partners. He has over 20 years experience in the energy industry. Peter's career has focused on the development of retail competitive markets, as well as new trends, technologies, market development, and sustainable solutions that create value in the industry. He has played a key role in evaluating opportunities and technologies in constantly emerging power markets. As an industry expert in demand response, he understands the highly complex interaction between energy consuming assets and power markets. Um, personally, I met with Peter for the first time um, yesterday, and one of the things that kind of um, struck me, he looked at my last name and he said, it's Nigerian. I'm like, yeah. And he said, if I were to take a second guess, you're Igbo. And I said, yes. So that, kind, that was my first impression of Peter. And that told me that he was very astute in different areas of the industry, not just in the energy sector,
but also overall as to what's going on around the world. Peter and Joyce frequently speak in, um, at different engagements, and he recently joined the board of the World Alliance for Decentralized Energy. He currently serves as president of the North and South Rivers Watershed Association, an organization devoted to protecting local watershed. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Mr. Peter Kelly Detweiler. So to start with this morning, on an upbeat note, let's talk about some of the strengths. So Amy's real power grid, that phrase emanates from him. That means we have a power grid which is pretty close to failing, and a lot of the machines on that grid, transformers, transmission lines are older than I am, which tells you we have a problem. And on any given day, on average in the United States, half a million people are without power for two hours. In Singapore, that number is a small percentage of that. In most other developers in the world, they work a lot better than we do. We have not invested what we need to in the power grid to the tune of about $11 billion a year, according to the American Society of Civil Engineers. We're under investment in our grid. We have power constraints we know about. We have the climate change we discussed. Water scarcity is becoming an increasingly larger issue. To, to frack a well in Pennsylvania, takes between three and four million gallons of water for each well, very little of which is reclaimed. <coughs> Power plants need tens of thousands of gallons for a thermal plant. And if you use dry cooling, it's not as efficient, so you lose your generating efficiencies. Uh, last year, where I live, it was warm enough in the summer during the heat wave that the token power plant had to reduce its production because they were dumping hot water into Cape Cod Bay, which was already at 75 degrees. 
Um, the Department of Environmental Conservation in New York has asked Nine Mile Point, the nuke on the Hudson, uh, to reduce, actually to shut down for as many as 42 days a year. That's a lot of lost money. They're, they're, what they're trying to do is avoid the impact on migrating fish, which are also, as we all know, critically important. So we're starting to see these trade-offs and a lot more tension between the system than we did when there were a lot fewer of us claiming a lot fewer resources. And then we have an aging utility workforce. We all know about population growth. And then we have this thing called leadership or not in Washington. And some of you might have seen the Shaheen Pork and Efficiency Act, which uh, Senators uh, Rob Portman, Republican, Eugene Shaheen, Democrat from New Hampshire, uh, tried to get passed. It was bipartisan legislation. The goal was to implement new standards, efficiency standards, training for students, and uh, the estimates were that it was going to create 200,000 jobs a year and save billions of dollars. Well, when it came up for a vote, Republicans, and I'm not trying to be partisan here, um, although I can be, uh, they wanted to tax more amendments on that, and it was also during the Keystone Pipeline thing. So ultimately, that legislation, one of the one few hopeful pieces of legislation failed. At this point in time, I don't think we can expect the solutions to come out of Washington. You really have to, it's like water through a stone wall. We have to creep around wherever we can because it's not going to come from there. Uh, Washington at this point is a lot like, you might have heard that story about the Russian who was, could be anyone, but in this particular case it was Russian. Because uh, the Russians don't generally tend in their stories to like each other. So this Russian walks down the street to the beach and he sees a little lamp and he rubs it. Russians are jealous of each other in this story. Now, if there are any Russians here, I apologize, but I had to find some missionality. So he rubs the lamp, and a genie pops out, and the genie says, you can have one wish. And the, the guy says, well, that's really cool. One wish. And he says, are there any catches? And the genie says, yeah, whatever you get, your neighbor gets two of. And so, like any good congressman would say, he'd say, take this one. <laughs> And that's what we see in Washington right now. Even if it's a good idea, whoever brings it out, it seems like the other party's opposed to it. It doesn't matter whether it's Democrats or Republicans. We just see total gridlock. Luckily, at the state level, like we see here, and at the city level, municipalities, particularly in the cities, we are still seeing tremendous signs of progress, but it's not coming from Washington. Now, there is cause for optimism. We have really rapid innovation. We have new technologies. We have a lot of investment in financing models, which we'll talk about a little bit later. We have increased speed to market. With computers and with the ability to interact with each other and our planning spreadsheets and so on, our planning capabilities are so much better, as I witnessed yesterday in this conversation around the master plan. And then this whole speed of innovation dissemination of knowledge. We can now run simulations and iterations for things that used to take years of real-time experience. We now can do that in a lab in a short period of time. I write for Forbes, and because I write for Forbes, I have the interesting opportunity to talk to a lot of CEOs and practitioners in the field of renewable energy and smart policies and so on. One time last year, I was invited to the uh, Wing Testing Technology Center in Boston. And this is just outside of Boston in Charleston. And it's a really cool place. The room is enormous. It's like an aircraft hangar. And companies pay about a quarter million dollars to have their wind turbine, the blades, tested. These big fiberglass blades. You basically lay down half of an eggshell, another eggshell, glue them together, and then they bring them in there on a ship. They hoist them up on a crane, bolt them to the wall with these enormous bolts, and then they shake them two million times sideways, one million times up and down to test 20 years of environment. We're looking at six to eight to 10 megawatt turbines that make the Statue of Liberty look tiny. So these things are enormous and they have to withstand all that weather out there. And they're multi-million dollar investments. And so essentially, we can now iterate and figure these things out a lot faster than we could. And when you go upstairs at this lab, you see the sine waves on the computer. So I was asking the director, what's the most fun thing you do here? Because this looks pretty boring. And he goes, well, the rebar in this building is 165 feet into the ground for one specific reason, and he smiled. And I said, what's that? And he says, at the end of the test, we get to break every blade. 
And so he said, if it wasn't 165 feet, when we start putting the torque on these, we might rip the floor out of this place. So what they do is they put these tremendous pulleys around the blades, and then they start to apply pressure, crank it down and down and down. And I said, what happens then? And the smile lit up his face, and he said, when those things explode, it's the coolest thing you ever saw. <laughs> Stuff just goes flying everywhere. And I said, well, can I get a video for Forbes? Because that'd be cool. He no, that's all highly confidential. I couldn't even tell whose blade was who in there, because they don't want you to know. Because all the new customers come in, to see how they do it, and they don't want GE and Siemens and all the others don't want them to know which blade. My friend who works in the industry goes, that's a GE, that's a Siemens, it's pretty easy to tell from his perspective. But he said they then take the slow motion films and send them to the blade developers, and he says without exception, they have told him watching those blades get ripped apart gave us new ideas for how to make things better. So instead of 20 years of real world experience, you can do this in six months to a year, and therefore, advance the cause more rapidly, which is pretty cool. This whole world we're living in right now is about substituting raw materials with intelligence and technology. I walked in this morning, and Jerry Marshall, who is the energy manager here, was outside. What was he doing? He was messing around with a dimmer switch on the 300 LED lights. You'll see them when you go outside, right here in Rosen. Those lights replaced 60 watt incandescence. Basically, reducing that load from 18,000 kilowatt hours, or kilowatts to 2,000, I'm sorry, 18,000 watts to 2,000 watts. That's a huge energy savings. Really simple. You know, how many people does it take to screw in a light bulb? Well, first you have to think about it. And he did. And so, why is that important? That's important because when you take a coal plant, for example, and you put 100 units of energy into that coal plant, when you burn that coal, you lose about 62% of the energy right there, leaving you 38. Then you put it on the transmission lines. Lose another 2%, sometimes more. Now you're down to 36, it gets to a campus or a house. If you use the rest of that in an incandescent light bulb or some other stupid thing like that, but an incandescent bulb is essentially, that's a heater masquerading as a light source. You're losing 95% of the energy that goes into that filament in the form of heat that you generally don't want. So if you can change that, basically, you need a lot fewer coal plants all the way up the line because you avoid all the additional waste. That's what we're talking about, substituting raw materials with technology. Now, uh, one of the things you hear about a lot, people talk about, oh, we did this, we did that, it's the equivalent of taking 10,000 cars off the road, 15,000 cars off the road. So one day, I thought to myself, well, what does that really mean? And I was going to invest in some solar on my roof, and then I realized how expensive it was. But I thought, it'll take this many cars off the road, I decided not to do it. So I had like 20 cars I would have taken off the road, but I didn't want to spend the 15, dollars $20,000 on the solar. So that night, it really started to get under my skin. So I had a drink. Then it got under my skin some more, so I had another beer. <laughs> then it really started to annoy me. So I had another beer. By this time, it was dark. I shouldn't have been in my car, but I got in my old Ford F-150, and I decided to take some cars off the road. <laughs> <laughs> so I drove to the local dealership, and I really wasn't paying attention, I should, because it turns out I wiped out about 20 cars. But guess what? In the morning when I woke up, half of them were electric vehicles, and the other half were Priuses. So I didn't do anything. So, um, but, but actually, when, with the equivalent of taking a car off the road, I did look it up. It's a car that drives 11,493 miles per year. Yes, they have a number for that. And it gets 20.5 miles to the gallon, this fictional car that the EPA and others use when they take a car off the road. And it, uh, it's 4.8 tons of carbon. So, um, kind of the next time you see how many cars have been taken off the road, and you want to contribute, just go to the dealership. Now, these trade-offs are becoming clear. We know more and more about this. When I used to go to a cocktail party and talk about energy, people's eyes would glaze over. When I talk about most things, people's eyes glaze over. But when I talk about energy these days, people actually pay attention. And Chris Halpin mentioned this, um, that people pay attention to him too. 
Um, so I thought, wow, we really must be on to something if they're paying attention to both of us. But people ask all the time now about energy efficiency and about solar and about what's happening in the market. And what's happening in the market right now, it's really fascinating. The economists had this piece um, four or five months ago about the Cambrian period uh, in the world when all the building blocks of life came together 540 million years ago. And suddenly there was this massive explosion in the evolutionary process of new life because all the building blocks were there. The temperatures were right, the carbon was there, all the pieces were there. And we are now, according to them, and I would submit to you that they're right, we are now in the Cambrian period for innovation and disruption. And it's an interesting place to be because a lot of the people who are innovating right now, first of all, you have computational capability, you have the ability to communicate all over the world and find like-minded groups of people working on the same problems. You have access to money like we didn't have before, um, whether it's ARPA e-money or whether it's venture capital and so on. And you've got serial entrepreneurs, people who just want to build things and create things. And they really, in some cases, don't care about the consequences. They just want to change things or see if this thing works. So one guy that I met a few years ago when I was working for Constellation, he was that serial entrepreneur. This guy was a genius. He, um, one of the things I couldn't talk about for a while, but he was doing, he was building meat. He was actually creating meat in the laboratory with the idea that if we could clone cells and turn them into hamburger meat, that we could feed people something that they were used to, that they liked the taste of, and we wouldn't have all the issues with bovine flatulence and water use for cattle and so on. So one thing he was doing was trying to grow meat in the lab. Another thing he was doing, he was the CEO of Konarka. And Konarka was trying to build, create solar using the old Polaroid plant in New Bedford, Massachusetts to print it, create wearable solar. First for the military, uh, because they could put it on tents and that sort of thing. And for any of you entrepreneurs out there, I would hate to say it, but it's sometimes true. If you can find a good energy renewable technology and also find a way to use it to kill people, you'll get more money for it. It's actually a lot of the technologies out there that are doing real well, whether it's microgrids or solar and so on, or flywheels. The military is ahead of everybody else in figuring out how to use it and how to adopt it. It's an unfortunate truth, but we need to use it to our advantage. So this guy was actually trying to create clothing that you could wear with solar on it. And he was such a serial entrepreneur, he was always thinking about things. He told me that he woke up in the morning and there would be yellow stickies all around his house with equations on them and other things, problems he had solved the night before when he was he sleepwalking. And I thought, man, wouldn't that be so great? You could work 24 seven and still get your REM cycles in. But he, he actually did this. There are people like that out there. Now what's so interesting about this big bang disruption right now, which is the new terminology is, they're, they're not even looking at your business sometime. They're just trying to build. In the old days, the model, Christensen's model, and Christensen, Clayton Christensen from uh, Harvard, He's sort of the guru around uh, discussions around innovation and disruption. How does it happen? His model was that companies would essentially pay attention to their clients who provided them with the highest margin, the most loyal clients who wanted the highest scale products. And we, when we worked at Constellation, we did the same thing. We would look at our biggest, most loyal customers, the ones where we got the most value at, and we would try and really please them because we really wanted that margin. And at the same time, New innovators and disruptors come in and they focus on the bottom. This happened with disk drives, it happened with computers, it even happened with some cell phones and steel mini mills, and there are many other industries, same sort of thing happened, where they focus on the bottom, building cheap and mass production, and then they move upscale and knock the incumbent out of the way. Now, in our industry, in electricity, the incumbents are still the electric utilities, and they have that regulated monopoly, which they some ways you should argue should because you don't want 15,000 wires and poles running everywhere. But they also have a mindset where a lot of them are close to retirement. They don't want a lot of change. There's another guy I know who's a CIO of a utility out in Seattle. And he wants to change everything. He wants to put information every place, smart meters everywhere, know the prices all along his system, and get efficiency with GIS and all this. And I said to him, sounds like you could save a lot of money and make yourself more efficient. He goes, yeah, but I got four guys with three or four years left in their careers, and none of them want to do anything that's risky, that could cause a problem. 
And he says, so that's a problem. And I said, yeah, and it's also an opportunity. If you can wait out those 1,400 days until they're gone, you can hire your own clones. So that's what he's thinking about doing. Now, what's going on in terms of those technologies? This is a clean energy patent growth index. And you can see what happens right around 20, 2008. Everything starts to increase. As a lot of new ideas of clean energy are coming. A lot of things really started to happen at the end of uh, the aughts. Here's where those are happening. You probably can't read this, but so the, the biggest one there is fuel cells. There were a lot of patents there. Wind was pretty good, and then you can see solar and the yellow goes straight up, almost. Just so many innovations happening in a, in, a, in a number of areas in renewables, which is really exciting because it portends so much change out there. I get these uh, feeds every day from Rice University and other places, and they're always coming up with new battery technologies, new ways of storing energy and fiber, uh, new ways of creating nanotechnologies. Now, we can't always think technology is going to save us, but we certainly are going to have to harness it where we can. And the fact that all this is happening is pretty exciting. Worldwide, same thing. And wind power has a huge number of patents because everyone's focused on that. The Europeans and the Asians are really moving wind along even faster than we are. And climate change adaptation is interesting. They're in the yellow. You know, there are, not, there are people focusing on that as well. All this to point out that there's this Cambrian soup out there. There's this evolution going on that is going to unleash not only the technologies we see today, but the technologies of tomorrow and the years to come. So David Elliott was here from Cree the other day and talking about his products, and he's an interesting innovator. Most of these innovative companies, the real disruptors, they're not going to be the Siemens and the Honeywells and the GEs because those guys don't have the same fire in the belly and they're more about shareholder value and that sort of thing and protecting some of what they have. Not all, but a lot of it. And the culture is kind of like that. But companies like Cree and these battery store, the energy storage companies, the battery companies, they're all pure plays. They're all looking to do one thing, which is to invent, promote, pilot their technology and then push it into the market as rapidly and successfully as they can. Their end goal, in many cases, is to be bought out by the likes of the Phillips and the GEs, etc. So they'll eventually be the places where they go to die in some cases. But then the entrepreneurs leave and they start something new and they do the whole thing again and again and again. And it's really fascinating to watch how that works. When uh, my colleague Leighton Wolf and I were at Constellation, one of the things we did was we created this technology called Virtua. And with Virtua, we created the capability for customers to see their usage in real time. So we put on a pulse meter, and then we would uh, send a signal with cell phone uh, to our office and pick it up in our computers and put it online. So people could see their real time energy usage, which was huge. We sell $365 billion worth of power a year over a transmission system that's 10 times the, the, the length and breadth of the US highway system. So we're moving this stuff all around. It's super volatile priced, particularly in competitive power markets, where one day it could be 20 cents a kilowatt hour, and the next day it could be a dollar a kilowatt hour. And for, for companies not to know how much they're using at what price it at, it's at, that's like if you went and bought salad at a salad bar, and you basically put all the stuff on the tray, and at the end you handed it to the cashier, and he or she said, we'll send you a bill next month. And you're like, for how much? Well, you didn't ask me when you bought it. That's how we buy power in this country. We don't even know what the price is when we consume it. So how can we be expected to consume it wisely and intelligently? There aren't price signals that then create those elasticities, those changes in behavior in response to price. So we built this platform, and steel mills for the first time could see how much they were using. And we had one customer, which was a big aggregation cement manufacturer. They just crushed rock all day long. They crushed big boulders and turned them into smaller boulders, and then eventually turned them into gravel. All electric energy. 10, 15, 20 megawatts worth of power. And if they shut those things off, the rock just sits there in the crusher and smiles at them. It doesn't hurt the process, they can turn them right back on again. So these guys were taking the price signals from us for all the different markets, and they were saying, oh, there's a difference between price here and price there. Let's produce as much aggregate as we can at this facility, as long as we have enough 
uh, reservoir on site over here, inventory, and so they were changing their production schedules in response to the real-time market prices. They were optimizing what they were doing within the context of the market and being more efficient about it because they knew what was going on. So we built Virtua and we trotted it out to my boss and then that boss's boss and then eventually the CEO of the company saw it and he was pretty impressed by it. And a little while later this edict came down that said 5% of our revenue from now on is going to be through new innovation. So I thought, well that's interesting. Well then, fortunately, I got invited to the innovation committee at this large energy company I was at. So what did the innovation company do? Well, we, the innovation committee. We spent the first two months trying to determine what innovation was. That gives you a sense of the problem, isn't it? So within a year, all the guys on the innovation committee that I thought were innovative, myself included, had taken severance when we got bought and we were all doing new things. But before that time, because we built this virtual thing and I was known as somewhat of the troublemaker and the innovator, my boss asked me to put together a slide deck discussing how we could reach that 5% goal. So I came in and uh, I had a very short slide deck. And I should have been, been more politic, but I kind of had a sense where this would go. So the first slide had an equation on it. And the equation was simple. 100% of 10 is greater than 10% of N. And my boss said, what's that? And I said, if you want people to innovate, have them do it full time. It's not a committee thing. It's not something they do as part time. The winners focus on this 100% of the time. And they even sometimes walk around sleepwalking at night, still focused on it. And he goes, OK, that makes sense. We'd have to hire some people. I said, which brings me to my second slide. So we flipped over the slide and said, what's that? I said, oh, that's easy. It's the severance agreement. I said, why are you talking about a severance agreement? I said, because anybody smart enough to be an innovator who come in here and do this knows that the life cycle of a product between innovation and pilot and getting it out there with contracts and testing and figuring out what the market wants and all that stuff, it's going to be three to five years. And we all know that somewhere in that three to five year cycle, our sales cycle isn't going to look so good. And the first thing this company will do is look at the non-performers and lay them off, which will be us, right? And he said, probably, I said, hence the severance agreement. And he said, well, we can't do that. I said, well, this has been a very efficient conversation, hasn't it? And essentially, that's kind of what happened to innovation at the company I was at. But not with Cree, and certainly not, again, solid state lighting. Look at this. The volume of the plants installed, including the 300 outside. These are for type A, which is the type A, we have the A-type lamp is that standard incandescent lamp. So look at that rapid penetration rate. And in 2013, it's even higher because where I live, you can now buy a Cree for $4.95 with Home Depot. So it's almost as cheap. It's as cheap as a, a CFL and, and certainly on a life cycle basis, way more cheaper than an incandescent. Uh, and they last you know, tens of thousands of hours. And then solar. So here's solar just over the last couple of years. And look at, you know, 2008, pretty much nothing going on. And then, boom, the technology gets ripe. Germany does its thing with a feed-in tariffs where they're paying 30 plus cents per kilowatt hour. That market was big enough to convince the Chinese in particular and the Malaysians that they would invest in solar plants at scale and put a lot of money into it. And so they essentially started building these massive factories over in China and shipping the panels commoditizing them, and the price fell by about 70% over the course of two and a half years. And so, boom, everything just takes off. And it will, at least until 2016, when the investment tax credit expires, which is a 30% federal tax credit. But, but this is a really impressive chart. And it's got the utilities kind of nervous, because the more people who put solar on their roof, those are kilowatt hours that are not being consumed anymore, but there's still an infrastructure that the utilities have to pay for. So this conversation about Yes, we have climate change, we have these other resource issues. We have to change, we don't have any choice to change. It also has to make room for the fact that there will be a high level of discomfort and there will be winners and there will be losers. In one conference I was at, this professor from Harvard Business School, she said, we need to ensure from the get-go that we think about and show compassion to the losers. For two reasons, one of them is, if you don't, they're gonna fight you harder. And the second one is, you want to bring those people along. It's, it's, 
You got to get them involved in the conversation. If it's an us versus them, it's just not going to go anywhere. So compassion to the people who being whose models are being pushed out of the way is really important to think about and keep in the back of one's mind. Here again, another chart from the DOE of what that solar installation looks like. Costs come down, installations go up. And wind, same thing. Are we noticing a trend here? You know, whether it's on the demand side with the solid state lighting, or whether it's on the supply side with these new technologies, we're seeing some really rapid changes. Now, some of this obviously is tax driven, but the point of this is, the tax policy is, you create enough of a foothold for those infant industries so they can stand on their own. And in some cases, you are seeing wind contracts for less than five cents a kilowatt hour. Um, and if, the, if you take out the production tax credit, it gets a little bit more expensive than that. Um, but it's, the wind is a very viable resource. Now we still have the issue of firming. What do you do when the wind doesn't blow, when the, when the sun doesn't shine? How do you deal with that? One of the things you can do is use your electric vehicles. So here again, same rapid curve. This last year in the US, we sold about 98,000 EVs. And uh, we're on track to do about 130 or so this year based on the sales figures through June. And each one of those batteries can represent a problem for the grid or it can represent a solution. So if you're charging at the wrong time of the day, you're increasing demand, but if you're charging at the right time of the day, you actually can potentially discharge back into the grid when the grid needs it and provide value. So one of the companies I've talked to for a Forbes article is named Ideal Power, and they build converters. They basically are the ones that transform the power from the DC to the AC or back, whatever is needed. So DC, for example, solar is DC and then it goes into an AC grid. And I was talking with the CEO of this company and he said, you know, one of the things we're doing with the Department of Defense is our V to G initiative, vehicle to grid. And I said, well, what does that look like? And he said, well, on those military bases, we've got renewables and we have some diesel and so on, but what we're trying to figure out is how can we take those electric vehicle batteries which are cheaper for us on a life cycle basis to use for transportation anyway, how can we multi-purpose those so that if it ever hits the fan, we basically can drive all of our electric vehicles to where we need the electricity and we can suck those vehicles dry. And I, and I, I said, tell me more, this is interesting. He said, well, school buses are now at the point where on a life cycle basis, it's cheaper to use an electric school bus than a, a diesel driven bus because there's less wear and tear on the battery, on the engine, excuse me, and less maintenance required. And some studies just came out of the University of Delaware, and there's some pilots now on that. He goes, he goes, but think about school buses. When do they run? I said 6.30 to 9.30 in the morning, and 1.30 to 4.30 in the afternoon. He goes, exactly. What if you charge those from solar during the middle of the day? And then, you know, you, you run it, and then whatever, basically lather, rinse, repeat that cycle we referred to yesterday. And he goes, now, he goes, what happens if you have another Katrina? Where do you shelter people? I said, the schools. He goes, right. And what did I just talk to you about? I said, school buses with energy storage. He goes, right. So if you have a hurricane type of event or some other severe weather, take all of your vehicles and plug them into the school. And each one of those batteries would have the equivalent of about four days of a residential household. So there's a lot of energy sitting there that you could use for a secondary purpose. That's the kind of disruptive thinking out there and the business models that are emerging more and more every day. Here's what storage looks like right now. Now, it's a little bit further behind the solar and the wind and the EVs, but what's so fascinating as someone who's been in this industry for a long time is five years ago, if we talked about solar or wind or LEDs, people didn't even have a notion of what the conversation was about except for the really earliest adopters and sort of the, the geeks like myself. But most people didn't think that we'd be anywhere near the levels of adoption we are now. And what's happening now with these guys is um, there are companies who have all kinds of different battery technologies. Probably heard about the Tesla and the Gigafactory that they want to build with a lithium ion, fact, ion battery. There's also a company uh, that's making uh, electrolyte. Electrolyte is essentially you take a bat and you charge it with electricity, you store it the power in the form of electrolytes, and then you run them through a membrane, and it releases the energy, and you can just recharge the fat again and again and again. And some of these guys have chrome iron technology, some have vanadium, some have uh, 
other different technologies, a lot of different metals, and they're already testing a lot of these in places like India to back up the telecoms system in India where it's 140 degrees and they want to see how these really work in hostile environments, displacing diesel. We're starting to see them in places like Hawaii where energy is 30 to 35 cents a kilowatt hour. And we're starting to see these start to mainstream where the batteries are in places like California where they're helping customers avoid their peak demand charge. So they are now starting to inch into the marketplace and find their first footholds on a commercial basis. And when storage matures, that unlocks so many other things because it allows much more penetration of wind and solar because you can start to deal with that intermittency issue and integrate far more of those renewables onto the grid. This dance has a lot of different partners and it involves a level of holistic thinking. It also involves a lot of data. Uh, when we had VirtualWatt, we were providing customers with one minute data with a minute latency. That is, they could see their usage a minute after it happened. So they could respond really quickly to what was going, take the appropriate uh, steps to change that all. <clears throat> and data is going to be critical. You, you need to know what the prices are, how much you're using, what the costs are. But storing that is going to be really important. And we also need systems thinking. Part of the challenge, and yesterday when I was in that planning session, I saw evidence of a very high level of systems thinking. What's so cool right now about what's going on is that, um, as, as uh, Steve Howard, the Chief Sustainability Officer of IKEA says, you know, the great thing about new technology right now is low-hanging fruit grows back. So one of the things we talked about yesterday in the group was how often do you refresh the plan? Because we're not living in a snapshot environment. We are in the middle of a motion picture and the frames are accelerating in that motion picture. So how often do we have to step back and look at that and take another snapshot of those frames? Where are we now? What do those alternative technologies look like now? The business model that didn't work yesterday, maybe today it does. And we also have to be capable of thinking of a systems approach, not just what is the direct cost of that thing, but what are my savings? As, as Jerry Marshall said, you know, with these LEDs outside, I'll be retired before anyone has to change them, and then some. He's thinking about this, the, the saved maintenance costs and the avoided waste heat as well. How do you think about all those things together? And how do you make it profitable? Now here in this system, now I went online just to see what, what folks were using before I heard it from, from Amory and David. Uh, and it's a quarter billion dollars a year just in the UNC system, a little bit under that. And with the community colleges and state agencies, it's an awful lot of money. And certainly we know there's been a lot of progress made to date, but there's a long way. Go. So how do you how do you do it? Well, we know some of that. Someone's got to be in charge. At least someone at every university or college has to be in charge. That commitment. Uh, the best companies that I talk to, institutions, it's real visible. They define those goals. They redefine those goals all the time because of the changes taking place. And they look for the interactions. They look for involvement. They look for those system-wide opportunities. Can we join with another group in purchasing more together and drive the cost down? And as we talked about here in these conversations, we define the culture that we want. The, the companies that I talked to for Forbes that do it real well, the first question I always ask them is why? You know, how'd you come up with this idea? What inspired you? And then the how, who did you bring on board? And almost every single time, it's this thing where it's not, it's not I did it. It's the whole group, and the, uh, both Amory and David refer to uh, Ray Anderson. He wrote Confessions of a Radical Environmentalist. And when he set those goals for interface carpet, he basically said, we're gonna have zero waste, and we're gonna use renewable energy. And all of the people in his, when he announced that, in his auditorium, their jaws dropped. And one of them raised their hand and said, how? And he said, you're gonna teach me how to do it, because I don't know. But if I set you all on this course, you'll help me figure it out. One of the things, again, I saw yesterday in this conversation was the exchange of best practice information, the flow of ideas that raises everybody's boat another level, was really, really inspiring to me. And clearly, you all are moving in the, direct, in the right direction of creating that culture that you want. And then you've got to know your cost structure. This is a bill from, um, actually, it's a Muni in Kentucky, and it has a lot of college use in it, and they pay you can't see this as clearly as I hope you would, but their demand charge for the period of peak demand they use during a specific period of time is almost half of their bill. So they're not paying that much per kilowatt hour, it's three plus cents per kilowatt hour, but they're paying an awful lot 
just to have the wires on the poles supersized. So they're focusing on how do we reduce those demand charges? And what does that mean? What does that look like? Know what drives your costs. This is a, a low duration curve essentially showing you know, where, you, where you use your power. When you're up to 19,000 kilowatts, it's only a small sliver of time when you're really using that much electricity. So can we identify that? Can we look at the data, focus in on when that's happening, what's driving that energy use, and cut it? Because that's where you're going to find your major savings. And then, once you get that money and those savings, you can move downstream and find other opportunities. Here is a, a nice little spaghetti chart we had for a client where we basically showed them, you know, here's one day that if you could bring this usage down from there to there, you could save $5,000 that month. The power of information is pretty remarkable. The next step here is to say, okay, what's driving that? What are the constituent elements? What are those assets that use power then that are causing that to happen? And if you could bring that down, you know, from the top day down to the average day, there's $37,000 a month. That's an awful lot one can do. And then here's another example, just two bad days in March. I mean, these guys are really unfriendly. You know, what's that back green camel doing right there? Right, two humps. That's just, that's just out of control. And that's costing that place a lot of money. Now here, you know, I had a chance to look at how does the, where do you buy your, your power? And, and it's uh, Duke, obviously, a big piece. And then the former Yugoslavia. Um, I was blown away by the number of co-ops co and munis. I mean, you have no negotiating power when you're dealing with, you know, Bosnia and Serbia and Macedonia, etc. This is a this is definitely a challenge. Um, you can't just say, oh, we buy, you know, a quarter billion dollars worth of power. We want a better deal. Not when it's fractured like this. So I leave that to you. That's your problem. I didn't come here to solve that. I just wanted to show you you had it. <laughs> um, so those new approaches. You know, what do we have to look at? Broader systems thinking. Let's focus on specific measures, a lot on the interaction. What is the market? Where are those costs hurting you most? And that's an interaction of your market structure, your, your electricity bill, and then how is your usage profile and your energy consuming assets affecting your energy costs? Then you make your efficiency investments, you look at your demand management. Wherever you can, automation makes sense, but you can't set it and forget it. Things always go wrong. But it is, automation helps because you can't run around and do all those things all the time. We, we know that. And then ongoing behavioral changes. The companies that I spoke to that did the best had really strong cultures. And they said, it's not just about investing in the technology, it's investing in the people. Because they come up with the ideas, they notice when things are out of kilter and they continually press us to do things better. So what does that world look like today in your traditional approach to energy management? We've got the ESCO, we call it 1.0 in our group. It's the typical energy conservation uh, measures, your performance contracting model, simple ROI. It's great for capital constrained fit facilities, and budget constrained uh, institutions like we have here. And it's a model that's been around for an awful long time. Been very successful. Where does it go? ESCO 2.0 starts to look at real-time usage, energy market data, your demand charges. It starts to look at that interaction between the market context and your consumption. And monitoring, especially looking at those larger pieces of equipment and sub-metering where it makes sense. It's not that expensive to sub-meter and it can teach you an awful lot about where you're using your energy and what it's costing you. And then analytics, intelligent analytics, great projects for students. Great projects for students. And 3.0, that's where we're headed. This is where you basically are looking at all these technologies. You're looking at storage, you're looking at solar, you're looking at all these pieces and saying, how do they fit together? So yesterday, one of the conversations, again, in that group was about microgrids and resiliency and reliability. And what happens if, you know, right here, we tend to have some pretty severe storms, or at least the potential for such. And uh, you remember Sandy a couple of years ago, that storm slammed into New Jersey. And one area that sort of laughed at it was Princeton University because they had a microgrid and they islanded from the, the grid and they, were, they had lights on and everything was perfect. Uh, meantime, one of the hospitals with backup diesel had nothing because the diesel didn't start. And a lot of companies or institutions that think that they have backup because they're relying on diesel 
Well, they do have backup unless there's a system-wide issue, like a Cat 3 hurricane that slams into a state and takes out 50% of the canopy and, and drives the, the grid out for a couple of months. In New Jersey, uh, Connecticut, excuse me, after we had the Halloween uh, storm, a snowstorm with a couple feet of snow, and we had Hurricane Irene, they wrote a thing for the governor in Denon Malloy called the Two Storms Report. And they estimated that if a Cat 3 hit New Jersey, they would lose 70% of their canopy, and they could be without power for one to three months, which is a life-threatening event. And if you have a Generac generator with gasoline in it, and you think, oh, I'm gonna still be able to watch ESPN, well, guess what? <laughs> the gas station down the street doesn't run anymore. And we found that out in Hurricane Sandy. Nobody could get gasoline. So when you're talking about hardening a campus or a house or a police and fire safety, if you're looking just at liquid fuels and we're looking at a system-wide emergency, you haven't planned properly. And there's a lot of value in having lights on when nobody else does for safety reasons and continuity of business, et cetera. So one of the things that will start to emerge much more strongly in Connecticut and New Jersey are driving it because they're past the failure of imagination. They've been hit, so now they can imagine what that feels like. It's funny how we need to get whacked upside the head with a two by four to learn to duck the next time. But they're starting to focus on that. So you get the batteries, the emerging technologies, wind and solar can't be interdict interdicted the same way that liquid fuels can. Monitoring and management behind the meter, renewables, integrating the renewables, firming up the renewables so that they're actually giving you capacity value so when the sun passes over and your solar doesn't generate, you dampen your demand someplace else in the system with demand response or pulling a battery on, so you still have a lower demand charge than you otherwise would. Utilizing those different instruments like Symphony, so you're getting something that's more valuable than just the parts independently, and focusing on that redundancy and reliability. Clear leadership matters. In all, the, in all the companies that do this well, the one thing that stands out, and you have it here in space, or we wouldn't be at this conference, is clear leadership. Behavioral impact, the fact that you all are talking about the students here, and how to involve them in this process, and how to make this interactive, means you've got this thing nailed, the behavioral piece of it. And the culture? <coughs> Some really great stuff going on here. In fact, within the next few weeks, you can look forward to reading an article in Forbes about this summit, because I'm definitely going to put one out there. So let's talk about a few companies that have done it well, and we'll wrap it up, because we're uh, right at 940 right now. Um, so Legrand, these guys make all kinds of electrical equipment. And they signed up for the, um, the Building Performance Challenge, which is to reduce power by 25% by, or 20, uh, 25 by 2020. And over their 14 sites in North America, they hit 32% in just four years. So I talked to the CEO, John Selorf, and the VP of Energy Efficiency, Susan Rochford, and I said, you know, how? How'd you get this done? And, and how come there are only two of you who've met these goals so far? And they basically said, start with the goal. Articulate that goal. Articulate it again. Get the people involved, set up the processes, do the whole thing. No one does it alone, it's a team effort. And you know, John Seldoff, the CEO, said, you know, we basically just said, you know, we're gonna give this a try. We sell efficiency projects. If we can't do it here, and we sell metering and sub-metering, if we cannot do it here at the ground, how can we sell that in our products? to our customers. How can we ask them to walk the walk or talk the talk if we're not walking the walk, right? So they basically said, okay, we got to the 25%, let's go for more. So now they're aiming at another 20%. And they've been so successful in the United States, they engaged all their employees in a power down day just to see what they could do if they really cramp things down. And they got another like 10% over that. And now it's pushing off to Europe, to Le Grand Europe. And that's contagious, there's, there's empowerment there. They were really excited about this project. University of Cincinnati, Joe Harrell's the VP of facilities there, and he's a lot like the people that I talked to yesterday. And they've done a whole bunch of different projects. And they said, you know, the budget cuts made us have to get together and focus more and more on what we could do to squeeze, you know, that penny so hard that Abraham Lincoln's eyes pop out, you know? Get that money out of that wherever we can. So they started to work on a whole lot of different things and they were ready for opportunities because they had this focus. So at one point, uh, 
you know the Cincinnati football team has a pretty high profile. So they were building a practice facility, and Joe Harrell was kind of ashamed that, oh, we have this really cool practice facility. You know, we spent a lot of money on that instead of academics. But anyway, one of the engineers came up to him and said, you know, if we move this wall over here where we need to, we could put an awful lot of water behind that. And Joe said, yes, we could. So now they use that water to store and cool, right? That's their thermal dumping ground, if you reservoir, if you will. So they use four million gallons of, of water to cool the campus. And they, they did it because they were already focusing on opportunities and thinking a certain way. So when that thing came, that hidden opportunity, which would have gone unrecognized in 99% of the campuses across this country, or at least a few years ago would have, they saw something there that few other people would have seen. The other thing they did, yesterday we had um, AirQuity in here talking about the air exchanges. They took their air exchanges in their lab from 10 to 15 times down to four. And they had to involve all the different departments to make sure it was safe, that they weren't going to have any issues. And they essentially were able to cut out an entire steam boiler because they didn't need this massive air exchange anymore. So they sent me pictures of these guys with blow torches cutting out the boiler and throwing it into dumpsters. Pretty cool stuff. Monadnock paper. So the, the press flag from Monadnock paper called and said, hey, we have a sustainability report. We'd really like you to write about us. And I'm like, yeah, everybody's got a sustainability report. Give me a hook. So he emailed me back the next day. He goes, we're in the paper industry. And the rest of the industry is dropping like flies. And we're actually making a profit, largely because of what we've done in cutting costs. I said, I found my hook. Thank you very much. So I talked to the CEO, of Richard Varney, who's a fly fisherman. The paper mills on a river, right on the Conchacook River in New Hampshire, in a beautiful little town. He can see the steam from the plant from his house, this, this uh, CEO. He, he came into the factory from, from his father. And basically he said, you get this done by having people in leadership positions that believe in it and get others on the train. The first thing he did was to hire Michelle Ham, who was the environmental person, and then they went into ISO 14001 and said, this is what we are committing to. And this is where we're putting our stake in the ground. And now they've achieved remarkable savings. They 2% year over year over year over year. It gets harder, but remember that low hanging fruit does grow bad. But it's a culture of looking for opportunities. And then finally, um, this is the IBEW, uh, National Electric Contractors uh, Training Center in California. And the best projects are multidisciplinary. They involve the architects, they involve the users, they involve the financiers, they involve the planners, and they involve the whole community. And what do they do here? They basically said, we want to build a net zero training center for our electrical contractors, IBEW folks. And we want to make this place really state of the art so that these students have a comfortable environment to work in, and they also can be disciples of the process. So, they put together these 60 ideas, they crossed off a lot of them, they, they trusted each other, and they built a building where they said also, we decided that if there were six of us at the table, there was a seventh seat, and no, it wasn't in this case the Holy Ghost, it was nature. They said, we are going to, that empty seat is gonna be represented by nature, that is our partner. Where is the sun during different parts of the year? When do we get the breezes? Where do we need shade? How do we integrate that all in? Where can we have windows that open rather than being closed all the time with AC? And they built a place that they said feels like you're outside when you're inside the building most times of the year. And I said to them, what did you fail at? What was the biggest surprise? And they said the biggest surprise was we spent enough time up front thinking about this and vetting all these things and working them through that when we built the building, we knew we were gonna screw up on something and we didn't. That was our biggest surprise. The building was actually better than we thought that it could be. And our students love it. And that, I would propose to you, is your biggest surprise that's coming your way if you haven't recognized it already. What you're doing, this community here, with the conversations and the commitment and the effort, that interdisciplinary, leave the egos at the door and put the trust right out in front of you on the table, focus on something that's better for all of us, that will be your biggest surprise. And the community to build may be even a bigger surprise. The friendships, the laughter, and dare I say the love that can be gained from that process of doing something that's bigger than all of us, that can be your biggest surprise. And with that, I thank you.
Anybody with a question? Oh yeah, okay, in the back here. Some of the utilities are really proactively and aggressively focused on helping um, with the customers and, and particularly um, if they have some new investment on the, on the margin, a new transmission line, distribution, uh, transformers, etc., and you are behind that uh, new uh, technology or investment they have to make and you can help them to avoid that, um, often you can be a real aggressive partner in that conversation. And I found that the munis in particular are interested, and co-ops are, are interested in helping customers manage peak demand. There's a guy named Billy Ray um, from Glasgow, Kentucky, who I also wrote a story about because he's integrating his uh, cable TV system with his electric municipality to drive a message to customers that these are the days we're gonna hit our peak demands, and these are the days I really need you to ratchet down demand because that's when we're paying the most money as a utility. I still want to sell you all the kilowatt hours that I can, because that's where I make the revenue that allows me to pay my employees, but I want to do everything I can to avoid those peak demand charges and make the system more efficient. That is, push more kilowatt hours across a smaller infrastructure. So it really does depend upon who's sitting across the table from you and what culture they have. Anybody else? Yes. Would you like to say anything more about parking? Parking? Oh, hardening. Yeah, I would. I would. Um, so, I just dropped this thing. Yeah, hardening campuses, in my opinion, uh, is going to get a lot more visibility in the future. And, and here's why, among other reasons. Uh, let's start with the most critical things. Avoidance of pain, right? The major area of avoidance of pain generally has to do uh, with your science labs. And there was a great, or not so great story, about uh, one of the schools that lost power and all the rats or mice died, the test animals, and they lost years of, of research. Uh, and you can imagine just how heartbroken the researchers were that all the animals died because they couldn't keep them cool enough and alive. Um, so that, they would have paid millions of dollars to avoid that pain, right? So a lot of times, you have to sort of turn that equation on its head and say, let me not think about what that is costing me. But let me think about how much it would hurt if I didn't have this. And in fact, all of us, is, we all complain about our electric bills as if it's a tax that we have to pay every day. You know, we take, take for granted the lights are going to come on, the fans are going to work, everything. Then we just have to pay this bloody tax to the utilities. When in fact, if we didn't all have electricity, we would expire relatively quickly. So back to the campus thing. I think the way to do it is to look at it on a modular basis and start with something relatively small. Obviously, utilities have to agree, and different utilities have different conversations with you about this. Say, where do we really need to have a hardening of our grid? And it starts probably in the science facilities and life safety, communications capability, that sort of thing. And diesel just won't cut it long term. It's not a viable, liquid fuels are not viable that way. But renewables and storage are. So then, you know, and these costs are going to keep falling. And Business models are getting better. I'm doing an article right now with the, um, one of the founders and the chief strategy officer of Princeton Power, which were kids at Princeton University who started microgrid electronics in the, mm, say, uh, mid-2000s, 2004 or something, with a professor, and then they got angel funding, and now they're one of the leading practitioners around microgrid development. And they have a really cool project in Alcatraz and so on. And they said, it's still a very immature industry. We're being asked to do more things and more adjacencies than we would like, and we can't specialize because it's still so immature. But the maturation is happening really, really quickly, driven by DOD and driven by Depart uh, Connecticut's DEP program, which Chris Halpin and Celtic are involved in and many others. And so that state of knowledge is advancing quickly. And I would, I would uh, submit to you all here, you should be thinking about the value of having certain assets on your campuses hardened. 
And what does that look like one year, two years? With, with Sandy, about 30% of the respondents, of 600 people who responded to a survey said they were without power for two weeks or more. And about 40% uh, were one week. So well past when your diesel would work. So you really have to think about those things. And, and again, it starts with what's the avoided cost? What's the avoided pain? Because you can justify a completely different level of investment when you think about it that way versus then, oh, I just I want this thing to generate power for me. Does that make sense? Anybody else? Yes? It's a really good question. Um, and sometimes, there are times when, and Bill McDonough, who's a really interesting person, who's a leading thinker in this whole sustainable space, is sometimes you have to recognize how much time you can spend on the conversation and how, then when it simply doesn't make sense, it's just wasted energy. And there will be some, I think you start with trying to think about compassion and understanding their viewpoints, and then there are some times you just have to figure out how to forge ahead. But let me give you a good example of what compassion looks like. So if you're a utility and you've got, let's say in California or Arizona or someplace, you've got all the solar coming on behind the grid. Now in Arizona, what the utility did unfortunately was they took a lot of money and they didn't tell anyone and they hired some, they created these nonprofits to fight the solar industry, all sub rosa, not good stuff, right? And it created this incredible level of enmity between the solar people and those guys uh, at Arizona Public Service. But there are other people who are saying, okay, if, if we're really gonna create solar and basically roll those electrons off our roof into the grid when we create a surplus and get net metering, so they're essentially paying us for all the surplus, and then at nighttime, or when it's cloudy, we're taking that power back from the utility, and our bill nets out to zero, because we're producing as much as we use, but the utility was still providing that backup function. Oh, by the way, if I have an outage, I expect that guy to climb my pole and fix it. How fair is that, right? And I see some solar companies who are just like, well, to heck with the utility. You know, we just want them out of the way. Mm -mm, no, they're a part of this conversation and they need to be compensated fairly. Because among other things, if half of this room did solar and net, net zero and everything out, the other half would still have to pay for all the infrastructure. Right? So there would be clear winners and clear losers. And what you really have to think about is how do you avoid creating that sort of bipolar situation and pull people along when you can, but when you can't, because we're facing these huge issues, when you don't compromise. And that is not an easy task. But to start by thinking about where you can be compassionate and reasoned and logical makes a lot of sense. Does that help? Anybody else? Please join me in thanking Peter once again. I, I strongly encourage you to take the time to go out and, and visit uh, his writings on the Forbes website. Um, in addition to the article, he, at the, the article that's coming, what he's written in the past is quite interesting. So uh, we're going into a break. Yesterday's 15 minute break turned into a 30 minute break. We need a 15 minute break today. And when we come back, two of the most exciting parts of the Energy Summit for me. First, we're going to hear from the students. And then secondly, this is, we're going to hear from the working group. So this is your heads up that each working group needs to be prepared to come up and give a five minute report out if you were not aware. So come back, hear from the students, and hear from the working groups. We'll be back in 15, and that will be 10 minutes after 10. Thanks. I have the pleasure of getting to introduce our five wonderful panelists from all different universities that have different, very different involvements with their schools and different leadership positions. We're going to start off with Joe Rand, who is pursuing a master's degree in appropriate technology at Appalachian State University and is a member of the ASU Renewable Energy Initiative. At Appalachian, Joe worked as a graduate assistant for the NC Win for Schools program and at the ASU Office of Sustainability. After earning a bachelor's degree from McAllister College, Joe worked for six years as the Director of Training and Outreach for the KidWin Project, 
a small organization committed to K-12 renewable energy education. He has co-authored two renewable energy curriculum books, was a keynote speaker at the 2012 International Conference for Education Embedded with Emerging Technologies in Taiwan, and served as a technical committee member for the American North American Board of Certified Energy Practitioners, or NAPSET, as some of us know, on their small wind entry level exam. Here's Jeff. Well, thank you, Linda, for the introduction. Um, I feel like that was a little long-winded, but really it's just because I'm kind of an old graduate student, so I've done a number of things before coming back to school. But really, I've been really happy to be here at Appalachian, and especially happy here at the Energy Summit. It's been a very inspiring and rewarding experience for me. <clears throat> um, so Linda asked me to speak a little bit about some of the work I've been doing um, in collaboration with the ASU Office of Sustainability, um, and particularly around uh, some data collection um, for our renewable energy systems here on campus. And this data collection we've been working on kind of has two main purposes. Um, number one, uh, monitoring existing systems to check on uh, system performance. And number two, um, we're constantly designing and developing new renewable energy systems here at Appalachian. So um, we, we need more data collection to inform our future renewable energy systems um, and to inform the design of those systems. Um, so the first thing I wanted to mention that's been especially interesting about this project is that it has been a, a very synergistic project with many different departments on campus. Um, uh, I listed a few here, of course, working directly with the uh, Office of Sustainability. Um, so the, the goals of that office, of course, were to monitor the performance of these systems and report uh, the generation of renewable energy um, to uh, like NC RETS um, to get renewable energy credits and also to share with our campus community and, and, and elsewhere. Um, another thing, another group that's been highly involved with this process is the Appalachian State University Renewable Energy Initiative. I'm sure many of you in the room are very familiar with that group and, and what we do. But for those who aren't, I just wanted to highlight, um, it's, it's a really innovative group on campus that's student run, um, student founded, and, and um, basically taxes our own students to bring in uh, finances to fund renewable energy here on campus. So every year, the, the REI brings in about $170,000 to spend explicitly on renewable energy systems on this campus. What that means is we're constantly designing and implementing new projects. And uh, for one thing, we want to monitor the performance of these systems, again, for our own purposes, um, for measurement and, and sharing that, that information but also, again, to, to design future systems um, and to inform our design process. Um, the last one I mentioned here is the Department of Technology, which has been really instrumental. Um, myself being a, a technology graduate student, um, we've involved a lot of undergraduate students and, of course, faculty, a number of whom are in the audience here. And uh, I'd like to mention Dr. Dahl, Susan Dahl, and Dr. Reichel, who have been very helpful, uh, among others. And, and even those that aren't mentioned here, the Computer Science Department, um, Dr. Frank Berry, has been very helpful, and, um, and also the physical plan, of course, and couldn't do it without our energy analyst, Patrick Richardson, who I hope you have had the opportunity to meet. Um, quite a dynamic character and, and a very brilliant and helpful person to us. So I think the reason I wanted to mention that this has been a big partnership for us and, and, and combining these multiple organizations and departments on campus is particularly because of our keynote speakers who, who mentioned a lot about trying to dispel the siloization uh, of, of academia. Um, so I think this particular project, we've relied on so many different departments and organizations in order to succeed um, in this project of trying to collect, monitor, and display the data from our renewable energy systems. Um, that, that has been very rewarding and very helpful to our whole campus community um, in order to kind of break down some of those silos. Um, for those who don't know, we do have a, about 17 um, different renewable energy systems here on Appalachian State campus. Hopefully you've had the chance to walk around and see some while you've been on campus here. Um, only a small handful, you know, two or three of those systems actually have any web-based um, monitoring uh, of the performance of these systems. And of those that are even monitored, they're not very accessible to students or faculty um, to, to sort of retrieve and, and utilize that data. Um, so our goal really, you know, one of the goals was, was to 
kind of create a system that students and faculty members and staff could access that data easily from the production of, of our renewable energy systems and use it um, you know, in their classrooms or in research and so on. So to that end, um, the Renewable Energy Initiative uh, actually allocated some funds to um, purchase the equipment to collect the data from our renewable energy systems and moreover to design and develop a, a web-based dashboard that will display the, the live and historical renewable energy production data from our campus. Um, I wish that I could show you a functioning dashboard on the web that you all could access today, um, but as you can imagine, this, this is a long and complicated process. Um, we've, we've been in the weeds with it for well over a year now, and um, while we've made a lot of progress, we don't have an existing system in place, but we're confident within the next year, you know, by, by the summit next year, I'm sure, we'll be showing you guys some, some awesome data on a, on a live dashboard. Um, I did show the, the picture kind of down there just to display what we hope it will look like, something like that. We're, we're working with a company called Deck Monitoring to design that dashboard. Um, again, the, the other major goal of, of monitoring our existing systems is for the Office of Sustainability to get accurate numbers on our production and report that generation to NC RETS so we can uh, either bring in revenue uh, through renewable energy credits or um, record that on, um, as part of our goal to be carbon free. Um, so, so we need to have these numbers accurately. Moreover, as I mentioned, we want to be able to provide that production data to students and faculty um, so they can use it on research. So uh, I show this picture. I'm going to air a little bit of dirty laundry. Um, the, the other reason why this has been really important to us is we want to be able to detect system failures quickly. And then that will inform our maintenance um, to, to quickly address system failures or outages. Um, I know this is really hard to see, um, but once a month, currently the way that we've been collecting and disseminating our renewable energy production data is myself or another member of the Renewable Energy Initiative will physically walk around campus, look at inverters and kilowatt hour meters and write down numbers and eventually get back to a desk and, and plug it into a system and it goes on the web as a PDF once a month. My point here is that once a month, has not really been quick enough for us to detect system failures. Um, if you see the uh, our, in our solar PV um, kilowatt hour production, this was for the month of June. We had zero kilowatt hours for our uh, biodiesel PV array. That's a 1.7 kilowatt array that produced nothing in the month of June. And last I checked, June is usually a pretty sunny month. Um, so. Again, the issue is that we're not detecting system failures until the system has been down up to a month, or possibly even more than a month, um, particularly for the numbers in red, if you can see, um, mostly in solar thermal. These are estimates that we don't, even, we don't even often do a physical data collection. We just say, you know, based on the design of the system and the solar resource, it's probably generating approximately this many BTUs per month. Well, that means nobody, for months, it, it could be that nobody takes a look at the, the actual production numbers. And that's a problem for us, because when we install these systems, we want them to be performing. Um, so that's our dirty laundry. I did ask my boss, Jim Dees, if it was okay to share that with everybody. Um, so that's kind of something we've, we've been struggling with, and, and we need to confront that. So by collecting data and, and monitoring our system performance, this will get much better. And then in the end, of course, uh, by detecting failures sooner, um, we will uh, maintain them and fix the problems sooner and therefore generate more renewable energy and that of course is a major goal for us. Um, the last thing and another reason why this has been extremely important for us is as I mentioned we're, we're constantly designing and developing new projects here at Appalachian. We have 17 but the Renewable Energy Initiative is a powerhouse. I can't commend you guys enough um, for, that, for the work that you know to have a student group that is committed to constantly developing and designing new projects that also requires data uh, as far as consumption, building consumption of both electricity and, and BTUs of energy. Um, so of course, if we're going, going to appropriately design a renewable energy system, we need to have this data. So something that I've been working closely with, with Jim Dees and the Office of Sustainability over the past few months is to actually um, collect some data on hot water consumption uh, in, in our central dining hall. So we have uh, a proposed project to build a, a very large solar thermal project on our central dining hall, which would provide the hot water 
for the dining hall, which clearly is going to be a lot of hot water. So what we've done is we purchased using REI finances, um, so that's student allocated money from student fees. We purchased uh, what you see on the left, uh, which is a electromagnetic flow sensor. So we're able to measure water flow, um, and then of course we'll also be measuring um, temperature, so delta T, um, so we can calculate how many BTUs uh, of, of hot water this building is using. Um, then of course we need a, a, a data collection or a data logger. And then the last thing we've been working on that has been a big project that we need to involve a lot of folks from IT and, and other departments on campus is to actually be able to retrieve that data remotely. So um, the, the device you see on the right connects our data logger to the campus ethernet so that from on campus or even off campus, we can see the, the live consumption data um, that, that is being recorded by, by the um, electromagnetic flow sensor. So that's been a big project for us. Um, the last point I want to make is we've kind of been we've kind of been burned in the past when we didn't inject our own expertise into the system design. Um, and by our expertise, I, I, I'm specifically referring to the renewable energy initiative, so the, the expertise of students, the expertise of our Department of Technology and our sustainability office. Um, and when I say we've been burned, I'm specifically referring to to a poorly designed system on our campus that has kind of been a black eye for us. Um, and it, I encourage you to, to look at it. If you walk, again, when we go back to Clement Student Union, look at Summit Hall, which is next to the Student Union. It's, a, it's one of the tallest buildings on campus. And it has a large solar thermal array on the roof, uh, which are overlapped in such a way that at solar noon in December, we're losing more than 50% of the energy, uh, available energy from those panels, because they shade each other. <laughs> So again, this has been a black eye for us and a, a very big lesson learned where we need to do the data collection, the resource analysis, and we need the expertise of our students, faculty, and staff to, to aid in designing these systems. So moving forward, um, <laughs> we're gonna do better than that. Um, so thanks, that's all I have for now. Thank you, Joe. Lots of technical expertise there. We're going to move, move on next to a different form of academic integration with some learning communities. Allie Puppo is a rising junior majoring in interior architecture with a minor in environmental studies at UNC Greensboro. Sustainable community design and green teaching buildings are a major focus of her studies and over the summer has been able to be a research fellow with the newly developed Center for Community Engaged Designs at UNCG. Here's Allie. Um, I want to thank Appalachian for hosting this summit. This has been fantastic. You get to come to Boone. Um, I want to tell you about our um, emerging energy learning community at UNCG. Um, learning communities are really nothing new. Uh, John Dewey and Alexander Mickle John were strong advocates, and in the 1933, the Black Mountain School was established. It was considered a um, experimental university because it was student it was led by student interest uh, focused on independence and central themes which included art and pretty much letting the students guide their own education. Um, our emerging energy learning community is interdisciplinary which is kind of different. Most learning communities are focused in nursing or in business but we tend to take students from every discipline, bring their different views to the subjects and um, hear what they have to say. Um, it's been a very good year. It's the first year for our emerging energy learning community. Um, it surprised everyone because we got to go to California to the Silver Decathlon. Um, we've done many trips. We're involved in community projects everywhere in town. So it's been sort of a big boom. Um, but in order for the community to stay growing, um, there's going to have to be a system sort of shake up in the free electives that students are allowed to take because they're not allowed to um, to come. I mean, basically, you're going to be over your credit limit if you want to participate. Um, charged 50% surcharge, and that doesn't really promote due diligence for the students, so they can figure out what they want to do. So I encourage any administrators here to think about that, and um, because LCs are so good for the students and the university as a whole, they build really strong. Um, bonds with the students and the faculty. So um, 
I think it's a good way for students to be retained at the university, don't lose our freshmen, uh, which often happens at our university to transfer after the first year. So um, again, I believe the, the biggest point I have with um, the energy community is that they need to be able to have the freedom to choose to take these electives. Thank you. Thank you. Our next student is Daniel Crudup, who is a 2014 graduate from Winston-Salem State University, where he majored in healthcare management and minored in business administration. He was recently recognized as the Winston-Salem State University Student of the Year. Daniel served as Executive Secretary of the Student Government Association, President of the Delta Alpha Chapter of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity, Chair of Ram Life Magazine, and President of the Rams Go Green, an environmental campus task force. He served two terms as an ambassador for the United Negro College Fund and Toyota Green Initiative, focusing on the issue of sustainability on campus. He was actively involved in developing, implementing, and promoting sustainability initiatives using two $500 UNCF grants to, to support the effort. He represented his university at the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education Conference and his environmental research at the Winston-Salem State University Scholarship Day in April. Daniel plans to pursue his master's degree in environmental health in the spring. Good morning. Good morning. First, I'd like to thank everyone who made this conference possible for us. Um, we've had a great time and we've learned a lot and we're really encouraged and ready to go back to campus and share what we have learned with our campus community. Once again, my name is Daniel Cruda and I'll be, be presenting um, the projects and the methods that we have been using at Winston-Salem State University to increase the awareness and adoption of sustainable sustainability on campus amongst HBCU students. <clears throat> as an introduction, I would like to say that, um, as understated in our introduction, I served as the Toyota Green Campus Ambassador for the past two years. Um, this role was created through a partnership between Toyota, the United Negro, the United Negro College Fund, and the 12 schools that comprise the CIAA and the 10 schools of the Southwestern Athletic Conference. The main objective of this role was to create and implement projects that will get students involved in sustainability issues. And I immediately went to my Ramsco Green um, sustainability group on campus to make sure that we achieve those goals. <clears throat> Our advisor, Shalib Brassari, and our group members to share a passion for educating ourselves and the students on campus about um, our environment and how it is our responsibility to make sure that we conserve and preserve our natural resources so that future generations can enjoy the same resources that we have today. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, this year, most of our projects have been focusing on recruitment, how we can get more students involved in sustainability and green issues. And we found that at HBCU in particular, many students do not um, have the knowledge or background of green issues. And that's because they're not from environments where that is taught in their homes and where, it, where um, it's practiced in their homes. And we also found that students oftentimes do not see the direct benefit of what sustainability is doing for them, although it is present on campus. And so some of the solutions that we came about to help increase this awareness and practice of sustainability on campus is um, partnering with other organizations on campus, such as the Campus Activities Board, Campus Life Marketing Committee, and others of that nature who have hold events regularly, um, fun events. And so we found that when we partnered with them in events, that students come out to those to those events, and it's a great time to introduce sustainability and green issues at those meetings in a relaxed atmosphere. And we also partner with bringing guest speakers such as Delight, who is a 102 Jams um, radio host, and Jada Drew, who is a motiv motivational speaker, who are very passionate about environment issues as well. 
We also um, provide handouts and pamphlets telling about things that are recyclable and what green sustainability is really. One of our most successful pro projects in the past has been our recycling program where we introduced recycling in the upper class and residence hall. And we saw from that 40% uh, increase in recycling on campus and students became more interested in sustainability. And we had over 500 students sign a promising or green pledge. And we also found that we were able to do this simply by providing those, that information, sparking up conversations with the students, and also moving the recycling bins from where they were in the um, break room to the outside area where they're more visible and accessible to students. And our current project is called The Green Zone, and this is um, a program where we're introducing the students to a area on campus in a, in a centralized area on campus where students can actually see people practicing sustainable habits and where they can find information about green jobs and other things of that nature. Because we believe that, it's, that it is our responsibility to make sure that students are aware of what's going on. And I'm not sure if most of you know that Winston-Salem State University is, um, was founded as a teacher's college and it's now becoming more of a liberal arts college. So there's no majors or minors still in the sustainability or green issues on campus. Our sustainability department is one person, so we don't really have many people who are um, working with us to make sure that we achieve our goals like other schools in the system do. So um, as a result of being at this conference, we're very honored to be here for one, and we're, we've learned so much and we're ready to go back to Winston-Salem State University and let others know that we can make a difference and it is our responsibility to do so. Thank you. All right, next we're gonna get into some transportation sector information. Chris Ward is an upcoming senior working towards completing his computer science and environmental science double major at Western Carolina University. He is also a photographer with the campus newspaper, The Western Carolinian. His environmental science capstone focused on improving commuter transportation sustainability, which then inspired the idea for a computer science capstone, which was to create an application to track and improve the sustainability of campus shows. Here's Chris. Thank you, Linda, and thank you everyone that made this possible. Coming to Boone and seeing App State and how sustainable and sustainability practices are um, being implemented at the university is a true inspiration to all other universities and other, um, other organizations. So Western Carolina over the past few years has been developing a master strategic plan uh, called the 2020 plan. And throughout the planning process, there, um, there was a gap. Transportation was not being uh, accounted for. So during my environmental science capstone, we focused on trying to improve sustainability from the commuter population, which was determined to be the, one of the leading causes for such a large carbon footprint. So to do this, we first started by monitoring all of the campus entrances. We could have used the counting strips to see how many cars come through each campus at different times of the day, but that left a problem with being able to actually get the statistics for gas mileage and such. So we ended up getting into groups and sitting out counting cars one by one, hour by hour of the day, and also collecting their uh, make and type to get the average uh, average miles per gallon. So as people came by um, during our, we performed surveys asking where they were coming from and how far or how many times they actually drove to campus or walked to campus at the way. Um, we decided to not only focus on students, but the overall, the whole pit, uh, picture. 
uh, faculty, staff, and administration, and students. We used a GIS software to map out the, uh, the locations of where people were coming from and how many miles that took. Then we calculated the CO2 emissions based on the distance and average mile per gallon of the vehicles. So, through our, by the end of our research, we saw that only 6.5% of the non-student population carpooled or vanpooled. And 12% of the student population uh, carpooled to class each day. This increase in student, uh, student carpooling could be attributed to more students live closely together in apartment complexes and such, while faculty live in a more dispersed area. 67% of student commuters travel mostly from the nine apartment complexes within the immediate area surrounding MCU, which is um, designated by the circle. On average, students drove to campus 1.6 or two times per day. So the total amount of gas spent by the WCU population per day, it, we determined to be $21,564, which is almost enough to, well, enough to buy a car <laughs> per day, which is kind of insane. Um, <laughs> even though the administration, um, well, no, sorry, student, the total student uh, population ended up being around $14,000. And we accounted for this by measuring the response rate and then how much uh, versus the total population and then accounting for that. The, the proportion of emissions uh, <coughs> created by drive, uh, commuting to campus versus the actual electricity being used at Western was 73%. Now, as we learned yesterday through the in industry panel, you can reduce the amount of energy consumed on campus fairly easily by optimization. However, actually convincing people to change their behavior is kind of hard. And to do, to do that, we have to disrupt and innovate. So, that leads us to our recommendations. The first recommendation was to improve the frequency and reliability of campus shuttles to the apartments in the local area and to provide incentives to actually ride the shuttles. One of the specific instances that we thought of was to have a system where you can actually swipe your student ID when you get onto a shuttle and then go about points, which would lead to some type of reward. I also, um, this actually was what led me to develop my computer science capstone, which, um, as Linda mentioned, uh, can help improve the sustainability by tracking the ridership counts for each stop and allowing the administration to determine whether or not certain stops should be removed from a shuttle route or if the entire route should be modified to improve efficiency. The second re recommendation we determined would be to improve the walking and biking options from the apartment complexes to campus. Recently, I believe, Jackson County, um, the county we're located in, has developed or has passed legislation to require apartment complexes to build um, walk, uh, sidewalks to the campuses. So that recommendation was pretty good. Um, the third was to incentivize carpooling and van pulling. We figured that you could reduce, we could have a carpooling pass that you could put into a car and the actual permit would be cheaper than a regular uh, commuter permit or uh, other permits. The fourth was to maintain inconvenient and expensive parking. 
or inconvenient parking and expensive parking permits, which is inconvenient and expensive, which would, <laughs> which would reduce the likelihood of people making multiple trips to campus each day and hopefully provide incentives for people to serve carpooling. The fifth was to create a commuter services coordinator. And recently, I just heard that there was a job opening posted for a transportation manager on campus, which is a great step towards this. So overall, we calculated that following these recommendations, we can reduce the amount of carbon emissions per day by 17.5 tons. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And to finish up our panel here, we have some exciting student engagement and extracurricular activities from Ms. Jacqueline Mills, who's a rising senior at NC State studying horticulture. She began her involvement in environmental activism by helping create a green fee for NC State in the fall of 2012. The next semester, she helped found a student organization on campus called Fossil Free at NC State. The group has used various strategies to forward their long-term goal of 100% renewable energy for the entire UNC system. Jacqueline has spent many hours collecting petitions, planning action events, strategizing, and pitching to campus newspapers since the inception of Fossil Free. She assisted with the coordination of a statewide student energy conference last year and is looking forward to further collaboration with students across North Carolina this upcoming academic year. Here's Jacqueline. Linda, thanks for everyone for being here. Um, so, first off, I want to tell you all about a really exciting thing that I've been hearing about a lot more recently, and it's not exactly related to renewable energy, but for those of you who already know about it, I don't have to tell you how awesome it is. The thing I'm talking about is C libraries. For those of you who don't know, C libraries are a new innovation catching on um, where folks can check out seed to grow plants. They grow the plants, keep the harvest, and then they harvest the seeds. And the hope is that they will collect those seeds and bring them back to the seed library. So it's continually having new seeds. People can check them out and more people can garden. Um, and a lot of people might think that that's the main purpose of seed libraries. We want more people to garden, that's nice. And of course I like that, I'm studying horticulture. Um, but that's not the main point, and the main point isn't saving money either from saving your seeds so you don't have to buy more seeds. The purpose is to preserve the genetic material for those plants for our future. It's really what's happened in less formal cooperative systems in the past since agriculture has began. You select the best seeds based on what plants you notice get different diseases or what might have cross-pollinated with something else and you know what the plant might be like next year. And over time, you're going to get seed that's better and better for the coming years and improve your crops. And you're getting crops that are best adapted to your specific area. So on a similar note, I'm not into renewable energy just because I know it's saving us money in the long term, even though it is. I'm not just into it because I love being outdoors and I want to do everything I can to keep it nice even though I do. So in the same way that seed libraries are a way of preserving our food system for the future, I see renewable energy as vital to preserving our lives. I think that many of my fellow students feel the same way, maybe not about seed saving, but we want a real plan for preserving our lives and livelihoods for those who are going to come after us. So today I'm here representing two groups up here, Fossil Free at NC State, and the North Carolina Student Energy Network. I could spend a lot of time telling you about the awesome things that Fossil Free has done because we have done a lot um, in just the past year and a half that we've been a student organization. We've trained students to testify at um, utility commission meetings. We've recruited 20 students for a national youth conference, organized writing letters to the editor. 
And this past fall, our group was lucky enough to have the chance to host Lewis Gibbs, um, Lewis Gibbs speaking at NC State. But what I really want to focus on right now is the NCSEM for the purposes of today. Uh, NCSEM was formed in 2008 as a way for students across the state to support each other and stay updated on each other's renewable energy goals and the work that they're doing. I told you all, students want a real plan for preserving our lives in the future and the lives of those behind us. This past year, we had a plan for NCSEN to get unified like never before and have a common vision that we follow through with, with a plan of how we can make a big statement all together as a state. We want to pass a resolution through the Association of Student Governments uh, to demand a long-term strategic plan of renewable energy integration for the UNC system. We know that we have really awesome goals for this system, but when you look at Duke's integrated resource plan and we see that only 3% of renewables, 3% of our energy is going to come from renewables in the next 20 years projected, that's not okay. And even when we do all the amazing energy efficiency work on our campuses, we know that this integrated resource plan for the long term is not sustainable. So, for NCSEN, we created a unified language for our petitions. We gathered over 3,000 petitions throughout the system. We lobbied student body presidents, telling them about this resolution that we had created. And half of them signed support letters even before the vote came to happen. Um, we planned a coordinated day of action where about half of the campuses in the UNC system did some sort of action saying we need 100% clean energy. And I know a lot of people here probably helped organize it on their campuses. We got media hits at those campuses and we built conversation around the issue by doing that, letting students know what was happening. And we won! <laughs> A piece of paper you might be confused about what's so awesome about this I don't know um, but these were all student by presidents it was unanimously passed I failed to mention that um, but every student body president signed and said we need to have a plan long term to get renewable energy we can't just say it's going to happen um, so that resolution really represents the voices of all the students in the UNC system right 220,000 students, and that's a lot. This is right after the vote. I wasn't there, but it looks like things might have got pretty crazy. <laughs> um, so people have been really inspired by our coordinated uh, efforts throughout the system. This past semester, my campus group, Fossil Free, applied to be considered for hosting a renewable energy conference throughout the whole Southeast for 300 to 500 students to come. And we were chosen! Yay! <laughs> North Carolina is where it's happening, y'all. I mean, they know how awesome we are. You all know how awesome we are. Um, so this October, I, want, I would love to see every student here come to the conference. And it's going to be at NC State. I know you can make it. We're going to help with travel and stuff. and get everything so that the maximum amount of students that want to be there can be there. I am so excited to see what great things come out of this conference because I've seen amazing things that students can accomplish when we come together in a big way behind a common goal. And that's what I want to call on all of you to do. Recognize that we do all have our own ideas of how things should work out best and that's good. Um, but we're so much stronger if we talk about these things together and go for a big coordinated effort. Thank you. Thank you. Can I have one more round of applause for all of our panelists?
some questions now from the audience about specific things, general things, however anyone's, yes, speak loudly please, and I'll try and repeat the question. So, uh, regarding the, the first presenter and the renewable energy uh, group on campus, what selection criteria are they using to pick projects? Because I, I suspect, based on the electric grid you guys are seeing here, that you're not getting um, competitive impacts on the renewables, and so there must be another selection criteria that are being used. All right, Jim, selection process for projects. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to speak to that. Also, I, I would highlight that the um, outco outgoing chair of the REI is in the audience, too. So, Josh, if you want to raise your hand. This is Josh Brooks. Um, so, Josh just graduated, but was the chair of the REI in, in, in the past year. Um, so, he could certainly answer similar questions, too. Um, our selection criteria is not based on payback period, though we do look at economics, of course, that's a factor. Um, a more important factor for us is uh, educational opportunity. Um, so <clears throat> just taking the wind turbine as an example, you've all seen the Broyhill wind turbine. Um, it is the largest turbine in North Carolina. Um, if I were to estimate a payback period on that, I might say 50, 60 years. Um, turbines aren't designed to last that long. So it wasn't built for economics, it was built for us to make a statement, um, for, for students to have kind of uh, empowerment and to take a role in designing and developing that system, and to have the educational process of learning how to go through that. Um, and in addition to, like I said, getting, getting the data and being able to use that data for research is highly important for us. So selection criteria involves ensuring that we have a good site, um, especially for solar, we do um, pretty exhaustive site uh, surveys and selection. Um, and then ensuring that we're, I mean, we do put projects out to bid and make sure that we, we get a good bid on projects. But like I said, payback, um, economic payback is not a, a necessary end uh, of the REI. And particularly because it is a student initiative. Um, every student pays $5 every semester on their, on their tuition. Um, we don't really have to worry as much about kind of a return on that investment. Um, for us, it's kind of a, a continual just rolling out more and more projects um, to, to reduce the carbon footprint of this campus, which is the ultimate goal of the REI. Thank you. I'd like to ask the last speaker, um, when you were on the podium, you used, you went through a litany of uh, why things needed to change and that we were going to fall short, and you used the word, we need to protect life. It was the first time in this three days I heard that reference made, and I'm wondering, in your messaging, did you use that as well? You referenced developing a large message. Was that a personal summary statement, or was that embodied in, you, in your larger task? Sure. Thanks. Um, I thought it went pretty good with the seed library analogy. I was just thinking about things that I could do to start off, and I thought seed libraries protect crops, renewable energy protects life. Um, obviously, just talking about climate change, I know that we talked earlier about the things that are going to kill off civilization. Um, I guess <laughs> I'm trying to say, if we are able to actually push for this renewable energy and get some long-term plan, then I was specifically talking about human life. Um, I think the other creatures will probably make it after we get killed off. If, if we don't, <laughs> we don't act now. <laughs> um, does that answer your question? <laughs> All the way in the back, yes. if you were in 
student breakout group or not, couldn't tell. Um, but we have a few broad things that we're working on this coming semester at least. Um, one of them is definitely going to be getting people to SSRC so that we can have another space for students to collaborate, talk about things that they've done on their campuses, whatever. Um, another thing is going to be recruiting for the Climate March, which is in New York. I don't know a ton of information about it, but you can come to me and I'll answer more. Um, but it's supposed to be the largest climate march in history. Um, another big thing we're going to work on is elections. Um, we've heard so many different people talk about various policy problems that are getting in our way. Um, and I guess that might be more specifically what you're talking about. We have been through several different strategies of how to approach that, but that's definitely going to be a big focus for NCSEN. Um, specifically, I think that what President Ross said in his op-ed, I don't know if you've read it, um, but about being able to produce our own energy and keep it and not have a bunch of regulations in our way would be something really awesome to work on. But we're totally open to suggestions. Whatever awesome ideas you have are good. I'm a bike commuter, I do not see myself, and there's, there are other two different programs that we have, but one that I saw, and I know Harvard has a large endowment fund uh, to be able to do some of these things, but they have a, a bicycle uh, commuter benefit program where they, they compensate um, employees and students and uh, faculty for, for riding their bikes, and I didn't know if you came across any, any new incentive ideas uh, for, for increasing bicycle commuting. All right, so we're looking at incentives for bike commuting. Um, in, incentives specifically, I'm not sure if um, we covered that, but mainly on campus, it was getting around on bikes because at Western, there's one bike lane um, along the main highway that goes through here, uh, through there. And trying to get people to ride from campus, uh, or from campus to their apartments and back, is what we mainly focus on. Um, but that does sound like a great program that we could try to implement. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, obviously, some of these things were a little disruptive when they started, but they're turning into great innovations on their campuses. So. That's why we like to include them. And Jed, are you coming up to, Jeff, are you doing the working groups? All right, we're gonna hear about our great work done in the working groups yesterday. So each working group will come up and have five minutes to review. Um, and I'm going to do the first one for academic integration. And Jed said he would be in the front row, but he just left. <laughs> anyway, Jed's going to be in the front row and be timekeeper and tell you when you have one minute left for those of you that will be presenting. I guess since he's not here, I get more than five minutes until he gets back. Don't tell him, okay? Um, so academic integration. We've had a great year. We've made a lot of progress in the last year. We um, made a change, as did uh, many of the groups last year, before the summit last year, to have our group anchored by two existing groups, well, one existing group, and then in addition, a, all of the sustainability directors from all the campus campuses are one of the anchors, and then what were considered academic leaders in sustainability were the additional anchors. Now, um, that academic leader 
took on a lot of different meanings for different campuses. We all started at very different places, but um, you can think of it as the academic champion for sustainability on each of the campuses. So those two groups came together this time last year and our participation and our direction improved quite a bit because of that. The, uh, when we started, I admit that we didn't have as much participation from those academic champions as we did from the sustainability directors, but we improved that greatly. Our mid-year meeting this past year, we had the big initiative, the big push, was to make sure that every campus had at least one academic leader um, related to academic integration of sustainability in our meeting. We were successful with that. We're continuing that success at the meeting here at the summit where we have about a 50-50 mix between the sustainability directors, operations people, and academic leaders. So that's gone very well. Now, we, um, the uh, mid-year meeting, we realized that we needed three things to sustain success in integrating sustainability in academics. And those three things are culture on the campus, structure within the organization, and then of course actions. And we have fantastic discussions every time we meet about the great things that are happening and on all the different campuses. And we're inspired by those. But we want to be able to in, help everybody get from where they are to where they want to be. And so that takes steps. And we realize that so we need these three things. We discussed this somewhat yesterday and realized that we don't all start with culture and move to structure and then move to actions. We start at different places and different things have been successful on different campuses. So in, at the mid-year meeting, we concentrated on that structure piece and specifically on where in the organization are the sustainability directors housed, that's structure number one issue, and then two, is there an official um, position, paid position for a faculty member related to sustainability, whether it be 50% FTE or greater. Um, and we found that at that time there were only two. That is improving, and we continued that discussion somewhat yesterday. But that discussion led to a lot of barriers to get there. So between the mid-year meeting and this meeting, we asked campuses to report on barriers, and our idea was for each campus to help another campus overcome a barrier that they've already overcome, right? So we were trying to connect campuses. We realized to, um, yesterday, though, we started again with that barriers thing, that we wanted to take a more positive approach. So we're doing the same thing. We're very excited to continue this today. We're putting together an inventory of not just barriers, but the successes on each of the campuses. We've got categories of academic integration successes, and we're having each campus today help us fill out that inventory, which ones they have accomplished, are in progress accomplishing, or have not touched yet. We will put an online forum together that has this inventory and allows people to communicate both online and offline with um, the what's, what successes have been made, what successes I want to make. I go look at the inventory, see who's done it, and try to make that contact and make it happen. Um, so that's about where we stand with academic integration. We're looking forward today to continue. And next we have, who's supposed to be next? I'm sorry. Transportation, and who's going to talk about transportation? Hello. I'm Marcy Bauer. I work in the Clean Transportation Program at the North Carolina Clean Energy Technology Center, formerly known as, did the Prince thing there, the Solar Center. So if you recognize the Solar Center, that's us. So, um, the, clean, the Transportation Working Group has had some somewhat unique challenges 
um, compared to some of the other working groups, and we're not quite as far along, but we're very excited to be making progress. Um, over the past year, we started off identifying some challenges that are unique to the transportation working group, and first and foremost was that we didn't really um, have a solid view of even who our target audience was, who we needed in the room. So transportation, as it relates to fleet, and you've got transportation as it relates to the rest of the community on campus, the faculty and staff. And none of that data or information or even um, programs and policies, as far as we could tell, is integrated even remotely on any campuses in the university system. So we had a lot of challenges going in. Um, we started off at our last, at the mid-year summit, um, looking at some of the metrics that we wanted to be collecting to be able to integrate a little bit more fully into this overarching goal of um, saving money through energy use reduction. So the metrics, as I sort of alluded to earlier, are somewhat segregated. We've got the fleet metrics, and we've got sort of the general community metrics. And I'll just give you a few examples of those. Um, there are more, I'm sure I'll forget some, so. Um, in the fleet category, we are, are looking at wanting to collect data on um, the numbers of vehicles, which is actually a lot more challenging than it sounds. Most universities either don't or currently aren't in a, excuse me, in, <clears throat> in a position to be able to collect uh, campus-wide data on the, even the number of vehicles in their, in, at their university. So departments have so much autonomy that the transportation folks or the, you know, the folks that are tracking the fleet are not able to quickly and easily gather that information. So number of vehicles, number of vehicles by type, the amount of fuel those vehicles use, how many miles those vehicles drive, the average age of the university fleet, those are some of the fleet metrics that we're looking at collecting. And some of the community metrics that we're interested in collecting, um, you kind of heard earlier with um, some of the student projects, relate to um, bike ability, walkability, um, carpooling and van pooling, increased use or tracking of use of transit options. Um, so we would, one, one metric um, in that category, an example would be um, bike rack availability and utilization. Others would be um, transit, existence of transit programs and ridership, tracking of ridership. So those are just a few of the metrics that we brainstormed at the mid-year meeting and um, elaborated on and discussed in greater detail at the meeting yesterday. And um, we're looking forward in the coming months and year to evaluating those metrics more in greater detail. So finding out how easy it is for all the, all the different universities to gather that data, who they need to talk to to get it, because it isn't, you know, that like I said, that data is not consolidated in one place. The, the transportation representatives who were in the meeting yesterday are going to have to go out and identify other people on campus who, who have that data or may be able to get it for them. We'll also be asking university um, transportation representatives to uh, identify how long it will take them to collect the data and uh, a few other sort of uh, metrics evaluations uh, questions over the next few months. We're also interested in increasing executive level support um, at the system and at each individual university for, um, for these transportation uh, representatives to be collecting this data. So essentially, we're looking to ask um, executive level individuals to make us do this. <laughs> so for some of our transportation people, they want to, they're very busy. It is very helpful to have that level of support and interest um, so that they have a little bit more weight behind them as they're going out and asking these questions. And then finally, we're interested in converting this data, which as you mentioned, was a, which as you may have noticed, really doesn't include dollars at all converting all of those miles traveled and gallons used into dollars spent, and then eventually, hopefully, dollars saved.
then I got to know some of them, so I don't know what that is. Uh, uh, seriously, we've, uh, we've had a lot of camaraderie and uh, uh, got to get together and talk, and that is uh, quite an enjoyable experience, and I've had a great time. So thank you for, uh, for putting on this event. The energy managers got together, and uh, we, we identified three key problems that we wanted to work on. Problem number one, um, not all energy managers in the state of North Carolina are equally successful. We don't think that's because of uh, difference in knowledge, because we have some very uh, intelligent and skilled energy managers. We think it's more that some energy managers have tools that the others do not have. We want to identify what those tools are. Uh, problem number two is that we're putting in some systems in order to conserve energy. We're putting in some systems to operate our buildings these days that are extremely complicated and technical. Now I started out as a blue collar worker way back 25 years ago working on boilers and chillers and things like that and uh, some of the pipe wrenches that we carried around in our truck were literally four feet tall and uh, we were sometimes called grease monkeys and uh, for good reason we came in covered from head to toe with grease. Those skills are still needed and the, the typical maintenance technician still carries those types of wrenches. But in addition to that, he sometimes has to wash his hands, go out to the truck, get his laptop, bring it in and plug it into the system and works like an IT guy. He has to have both sets of skills. And the problem we're running into is there is a shortage of that type of skilled person um, in North Carolina. Um, I made a statement the other day that in the state of North Carolina we have 100 counties and I would, uh, I would like to see if someone can find three counties where you can find six people in the entire county who you can bring into any building with their laptop, sit them down and say here's the control system, here's the website, find our problem and fix it. If you can find six guys in any county, uh, in three of our counties, I, I would be surprised. Um, they're very difficult to find, and when you find them, uh, they're very difficult to keep. Third problem is that, uh, um, so skill, and the third problem is, often the energy managers start talking and we say, you know what we're doing on our campus, we're doing X, Y, Z. And somebody else will say, oh, well, that's a great idea. We need to try that on our campus. Okay, that's great. You know what's worse? When we say, we're doing X, Y, Z on our campus, and somebody says, yeah, we're doing that too. They say, yeah, but well, we really had a problem with ABC. And the other guy says, yeah, we had the same problem. That's sad. You shouldn't have a problem but once. Am I right? Yep. That means, you're not communicating, so that's a third problem that we wanted to deal with. So we divided our group into three teams, each team dealing with each one of the problems. First team dealing with the problems of keys to success, we call it. We're developing and have developed a survey that we want to send out. We figured the best way to find out what are the keys to success for energy managers is to ask the energy managers. So we're going to send out a survey to energy managers to find out what the keys to success are. What do you need? What kind of relationships do you need on your campus? What makes a successful energy manager? Then we want to develop that into a, 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 an executive level paper that we send out to the campus executives all across the state, chancellor, vice chancellor, physical and director level, so that they know here's where the very successful programs are in Europe, what will be their keys to success. Um, the second problem is, uh, our second group is working with Wake Tech to actually develop what it would take to create a super tech. And then we want to, once they have that information, they want to develop that into a curriculum that they then pass on to the community colleges so we can start growing our own super techs right here in the state of North Carolina. And eventually maybe we have so many we can start exporting some of them. Um, and that, that would be great. And then the third, our third group has actually developed a collaborative um, a site, a listserv, which is pretty old technology, where we can share information. And they're already putting up best practices. Here are some of the things that are successful 
at our campuses across uh, North Carolina. And we all get that in the form of an email, either daily or weekly digest or whatever. So uh, not just energy managers, but anybody who has an interest in energy can get on that list, sir, and access that information. We can also ask questions. We were trying to program, you know, uh, XYZ controller and had this problem. Does anybody have a similar problem? So we can hopefully only have one problem one time. Wouldn't that be great? Did I miss anything? Thank you. State, Director of Capital Projects. Um, it's great to be here. I'm going to report out uh, some accomplishments uh, for the High Performance Campus Design Group. Um, first, real quick, I just want to thank a few folks. Um, Rosalba Ledesma, where are you? Is she in here? She's uh, There she is in the back. I want to thank her for her leadership. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to give you a bad analogy of Top Gun and for pilot, she's Maverick and I'm Goose. So she's the pilot, I'm the co-pilot, but I wanna thank her for her leadership over the past year. And also wanna thank all the participants uh, of the High Performance Design Group. Um, really great group of design professionals, architects, construction administrators, and others who've joined us over the past year to help us get where we are. Also wanna thank Roy Tolbert from RMI. Uh, he helped facilitate yesterday and was a great outside perspective and helped uh, get us through the day yesterday, and also uh, Peter Kelly Devwiler, he, he joined us yesterday, and appreciate the plug this morning for uh, our group. <laughs> um, so what did we, uh, what did we accomplish? Um, over the past year, we've really been working on a, a real specific deliverable. Um, if you're familiar with the UNC uh, system sustainability policy, um, there's reference in that policy at the very end of the, of the, of the policy in a paragraph, it talks about uh, developing best practices, um, guidelines, and, and implementation plan for all the sustainable practices that are listed in that policy. So last year we pulled the policy and said, well, you know, what are we supposed to have best practices for? You know, what are we supposed to be striving to achieve? And there's a whole list of them. I'll read them real quickly. Systematic integration of sustainability principles, master planning, design and construction, operations and maintenance, climate change mitigation and renewable energy, transportation, recycling and waste management, and environmentally preferable purchasing. And so the best we could tell is that the policy exists. There's really no, uh, that we could find uh, a list of best practices for any of those items. So we sort of took the charge as a group to develop the best practices guideline for master planning, design and construction. So we've literally been working on that the past year, um, had a great session yesterday. Uh, we essentially uh, have a draft in hand, uh, so we uh, broke the group up into three, three sections, uh, a master plan group, a design group, and a construction group. We went through the draft best practices guideline, uh, we tweaked some things, uh, had some great collaboration and conversation about what's in the document so thus far, what, what, we need, what we need to add to it, what we need to tweak. And the real hope is that before the mid-year meeting, we'll have that finalized, uh, sent up to GA for review, and hopefully ultimately endorsement by the president, uh, so that we can put that put that into practice, and all the campuses will have this resource, this resource of best practices to, to look at and to, to use as they go forth in designing and constructing uh, facilities. Um, also had an opportunity yesterday to hear from uh, Renee Hutchinson. She's been a very active member of our group. She's an architect with NC Diener, or works with Lynn Hoy, uh, formerly State Energy Office. She uh, has got her hands in a lot of things, um, but uh, particularly she keeps her finger on the pulse of Senate Bill 668, uh, which is the legislation that was passed several years ago regarding uh, energy conservation and water conservation that's required by uh, all new facilities uh, over 20,000 gross square foot or renovations over 20,000 gross square foot and over 50% of insurance value. And, and, and so we've been uh, involved in that for a long time now. We've got several projects that have gone through 668, are now in a measurement verification stage. Um, but just last year, uh, House Bill 628 came out, uh, made some adjustments to Senate Bill 668. So she gave us a presentation on that yesterday, kind of 
brought us all up to speed on what our requirements are legislatively uh, regarding 668. And then she followed that up with a presentation about measurement verification and um, all the you know challenges that we're having statewide with really verifying um, how our buildings are doing uh, relative to 668 and the energy modeling that's required to prove that we're meeting those goals. Um, so a lot of lessons learned yesterday came out of that. Some good discussion, which uh, made a good segue into our, our working group sessions with the uh, best practice. So um, we think we've made a lot of headway this year. Hopefully we'll wrap this uh, little piece up and we're really looking forward to uh, this afternoon continuing some discussion we started yesterday with future goals of the group and looking forward to having the student input as well um, and getting some of their insight on what they expect out of their facilities on, on, on campus. So uh, I think in a nutshell that's about it. Any questions? at North Carolina State and it's my pleasure to bring you an update on what's happening with the finance and regulatory groups activities. Uh, we have a tremendous group and I want to thank uh, Miriam, my co-chair, in uh, terms of all the things that have happened over the past year. Uh, as you might expect, um, many of the activities that, uh, and particularly uh, some of the legislation that's occurred over the last few years are what we call unfunded mandates. And that means that uh, we've been given a charge to accomplish things, uh, but no real uh, funds to be able to do that. And so it's no surprise that about three of the four activities that the Finance and Regulatory Group has been working on are related to trying to identify new sources of funding to help us towards those goals. So let me uh, recap the four activities for you. Uh, first, uh, we're very interested in uh, making a proposal to be able to establish a revolving fund uh, that institutions can draw upon for energy-related projects less than $500,000. Um, we think that this is a rich area for campuses to be able to implement. Uh, it's kind of a gap in the funding in terms of our ability to bring dollars to bear and so we'd like to make a proposal on how that would happen and uh, have drafted the legislation that uh, might make that possible. Second, um, again, to be able to, to bring more tools in the toolbox of accomplishing energy-related projects, uh, we'd like to explore a model to expand the use of uh, a performance contracting concept uh, really to be able to fund larger scale projects and this would give us more flexibility, more opportunities to be able to accomplish those things that are going to be so important in the next few years uh, as we move uh, with a more mature program after we try to pick the fruit that's higher up on the tree uh, that's likely to, to cost a little bit more. Our third item uh, was titled Strengthening House Bill 1292. And those of you that are familiar with that bill know that its intent was to allow us to be able to carry forward uh, funds from our operating budgets to be able to reinvest in energy-related activities. And uh, that it has worked well in the last several years, uh, but in terms of our declining utility budgets and budget cuts to those uh, funds, uh, it means that uh, the caveat in the bill that requires that we have a utility surplus in order to carry forward these funds means that uh, over time we will see less and less available for energy projects. So we would like to go back in and uh, remove that caveat and be able to stabilize the funding so we, we know what we can achieve each year. Well, our fourth area deals with renewables and uh, our group here has done a tremendous amount of work in the past to be able to put in place uh, the, all the documentation to be able to do power purchase agreements on solar thermal projects and all of the roof leases and other things that are required of that. Uh, but now the solar market is changing and it's more difficult to fund those projects and so we've begun to refocus the efforts of the group 
uh, on looking at the potential opportunities for uh, solar PV on our campuses. And uh, so the group is going to be tackling that over the next year uh, to be able to um, be able to support the activities of the eLab Accelerator and really be able to jumpstart our discussions about solar PV on the campuses. So tomorrow, or rather this afternoon, uh, we're going to try to bring this all together in discussion about uh, assembling our legislative proposals, about creating a tool to be able to do the briefings and uh, information sessions that we need on the campuses, and then uh, how do we move these efforts forward to be sure that uh, they gain a place on the UNC legislative agenda. And so that's uh, quite, a, quite a large task, but we think that along with the timeline and some um, condensed activity here to be able to support this, that we can have these ready to be considered for the long session uh, starting this coming January. Uh, our last act activity I want to tell you about is that uh, Len Hoy was with us and talked about uh, really what's next after USI. And so we've all um, participated in the Utility Savings Initiative, and yet we all know also that the goal there was to deliver 30% reductions by 2015. So we need to be able to think about what happens after next year and how do we want to, to keep the program uh, active and invigorated. So those will be a part of our conversations this afternoon as well. Thank you. My name is Josh Brooks. I attended the uh, student industry partners meeting yesterday. I'm a recent graduate of ASU. As Joe mentioned earlier, I'm the, uh, what feels like a lifetime, I was chair of the REI. I finally set aside some of that to fill that role. I'm very excited about that. And as a quick note, if there's any questions about the REI and our functions, I noticed there were a couple. Speak to me afterwards, I'll be happy to help. But as my role, at this university, I feel it's uh, uniquely appropriate that I get to sort of talk about what happened with the student industry partners yesterday. Um, because I feel like I was in that gray area between a student and a colleague, look, I look out in the audience and I see a number of people that I've worked with here. And uh, yes, they're teachers, they're staff, but I really do view them as colleagues. And if I'm to uh, understand the theme of this summit, then I believe that that is an appropriate uh, conclusion to draw. It seems to be a very symbiotic relationship that we have between students and all of you. So thank you for taking your students seriously and drawing their passion and trying to do something as a, somebody who still intimately knows what it's like to be a student, I appreciate that. Uh, first off, we had the um, Student Energy Network come by yesterday for the purpose of collecting all these students in a unified mindset of we need renewable energy in this system. Get that idea to them, let them push it at their individual schools, hopefully something beautiful can grow from that. Um, Next, we talked about what it is to be educated. Education is far more than a degree, at least it is in uh, my book. It's often being experienced. Uh, experience like one with the REI, for example, is something that you can't find in a classroom. I found it to be more valuable. That in itself is an education, something that we think is vastly important for every student to do. Yes, go to class, do good there, but Seek out these internships, okay? Find yourself in the workplace somehow. Prove your worth and you will learn there. You will learn there quickly. Um, lastly, and what I thought was a very noble idea, um, we've, we've talked a lot about sustainability and how we're having to redefine that, right? And as all of us now, it's very easy to jump on the wagon of, okay, we immediately we all have to be energy managers, we have to be conservation experts in order for sustainability to have any validity in the next coming years. Well, we recognize that there are some systems that are just not working anymore. Dare I say they may be broken. So what that means is we have to redefine every aspect that we operate in. What does that mean? It means 
that no matter what your discipline brings sustainability to that if you want to be an artist there's no shame in being an artist just realize that that definition has slightly changed because the times have slightly changed you need to bring sustainability to that what better way to spread that message than over a variety of, uh, of different topics. So that's something that we talked a lot about. Um, on behalf of the students, I would like to thank you all for your care, your attention that you're providing them, and the appreciation that you give them, um, helping them grow in this. So what we're working on now as students it's coming together, maybe creating more of these partnerships, more of these organizations all across the system. Um, if we can do that, you've already gave us your back, right? So why not? If you have the support and we have the willpower, then something great can happen. That's where the students stand right now. They're ready to make stuff happen. We're forming those partnerships right now. Uh, it looks to be exciting. Thank you for your time. set up there. Fix yourself a plate of food and proceed to your working group. Today we're asking that the students join the working group of your choice and you just had a chance to hear what they're up to so I hope you'll enjoy that. So the campus-based energy efficiency will be an attic window. High performance campus design will be in McRae Peak. Academic integration will be in Linville Falls. Transportation oriented opportunities will be in Roman Mountain Room and finance regulatory and energy generation in Callaway Peak. Those meetings will start 30 minutes from now at 10 minutes after 12. The industry partners will be attending a luncheon hosted by Randy Gonzalez that will be in Table Rock. What I would like for the industry partners to do is we see you as a working group as well. So in your time today, we'd like to give you five minutes at the closing session to, to report to us as a working group, you know, what, what it is that you would like to say to us as a group. And then the other thing that I want to plug is you've all seen the website, but we've taken most everything on the website and built something this year called the Solutions Guide. And so it puts everything into one PDF document. We have a, a, a fancy viewer on our website. So if you want to send your boss or your boss's boss or your your friend or your neighbor a link to what we're up to and what you were up to these last three days, send them to the solutions guide. There you're going to find data from all the campuses, you're going to find success stories from every campus, you're going to be able to read about all of the working groups, you're going to hear about the interesting solutions that our business partners bring to bear. It's about a hundred page document, but you know people can go through it as, at, as much or as little as they want, but it's our effort to try to make this as packaged in a way that you can take it to others. One other thing I want to mention, we have videoed virtually everything and we have permission from all of our speakers to show these videos again. And hopefully in about two weeks, all of these videos will be posted on our website. As will, well, we've already posted the videos from years one and two. So if you're a teacher and you're thinking, gosh, I would love for my students to hear what the other students had to say. Well, I would love to hear what Avery Lovins or David Orr 
or, or Peter had to say this morning. Bring those lectures into your class. If you want to package them up and have a, a morning where you invite hundreds of people to an auditorium, we think that would be a great idea. And if you wanted to do an event like that, give us a call. We'll do anything we can to help you host that and make, make, you know, give you the ability to host your own energy summit for your own community. So again, uh, in 30 minutes, please be in your working groups. Let's get those action plans going. And again, enter through the bookstore. Thanks much.